Everybody can hear us out there? Yes. Thank you. So, just one sec, we got one little computer thing to iron out and we'll be launching. Tell her to work I'm in. I haven't yep. to, to the internet with you. All right, it says I'm connected. Um, welcome everyone to the April 16th, 2024 BOT meeting executive session to get started. So we are late launching into our open meeting, regular meeting, but um, we'll go ahead and get started. So we have a get going a consent agenda with three items on it. Um, and if you have any clarifying questions or anything for um, Miranda, now's the time. I had one s small one on the minutes, and I meant to tell you what we were doing. Um, on the March 19th minutes, um, genus is llama with one L. <laughs> so I don't know if that needs, if that matters. That's the only thing I saw. Um, species is, next one down is llama with two L's. Um, but other than that, I have nothing else. Anyone else have anything they saw in the minutes? Or, um, or the warrants? If not, I move um, to approve the consent agenda. Second. So Chris had, or Nicole made a motion. That Chris had a second. Um, Thank you, Mayor Macy. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Sterling. Yes. Trustee Larson. Yes. Mayor Billy? Yes. Trustee Ty? Yes. Trustee Corvalon? Yep. Yes. Thank you. And Trustee Miller? Yes. All right. Thank you. The motion passes. Thank you. Appreciate it. Well, that will go right into our staff reports. Um, do any of the trustees have any questions on, or comments on staff reports? Uh, is Rita in the room? No. no. Oh, happy to pass on any question or potentially answer any question you might have. Yeah. So, hey, Miranda, under the property um, taxes, there was um, the deficit that we were seeing. Is is that a part of some of the legislation that was late to come into the year, or is is there? A, does she have an understanding of why that is? Um, that's specific to that legislation. Okay, that's what I thought. I just wanted to make sure that there yeah. wasn't some other anomaly happening. Yeah, nope. Perfect. Mayor, really, I'd love to draw attention to just two quick things, just mainly for the public. Um, town administrator uh, posting is officially out with a due date of May 3rd, so that's out, and so we encourage people to apply, and then just want to publicly announce that uh, Nikki Dunn, Parks Manager, has been named as Interim Town Administrator. I will start to train her in a three-week period um, while I'm still here, and then she'll take over officially on May 25th, and will remain Interim Town Administrator until you have hired, and the new person has started. So, huge thanks to Nikki for stepping into that role. Thank you. Um, yes, thanks, Nikki. Another question, Miranda. Uh, a couple of months ago, we had talked about uh, Boulder County sort of spreading out how much, how many folks they would have uh, doing, you know, doing the speeding, uh, just people that were just on patrol for speeding. 
Uh, does, is there, I, I remember that Sergeant Miriam was going to be looking at some of the events and everything else that we've had and was just wondering if maybe, you know, if we don't have an answer today, but for the next report, we can kind of take a look at when he expects to have um, some of those numbers spread out more um, rather than what was kind of originally starting to happen where it was just a set number at the beginning of the year. But don't know if you have any more context for that or information. Yeah, if I'm understanding your your question, I mean, originally we had released it where all 30 days were open and that's been dropped down to 10. Right. And so it's it's 10 shifts uh, that do kind of scatter all over the month. Um, but he and some of the commanding staff are actually going to come to you on May 21st, which is a general update, some announcements, share with you what's been going on with recruitment and, and can bring some more of that dialed in figures and share with you how it's been going. So we're very much intending on a pretty big Boulder County presentation next month as a part of the, the BOT reports. That's okay, perfect. Great. Yeah, I was kind of wondering about the the hiring, how that's going. Um, I kind of totally been wondering about that. Um, great. And then I don't see anything in Macy in your report, but I think you had a little election go down between now and your last report. So. Well done. I think you've been busy. So thanks. Good job. Anything else? Uh, if if not, we'll go um, into BOT reports. Any anything you want that anyone would want to add um, or talk about with their reports? Yeah, and and real quick, Mayor Billy. Um, hey, everyone, just. Fantastic job during this last snowstorm and just keeping up to date and everything. I know that's a discussion later, but it is reflected in the reports and just as a preemptive, like that was just really great work. I mean, it was out of our control, but you guys handled it really well. So thank you. Thanks, Nicole. As we've had lots of emergencies lately. Um, yes, we have. If nothing else on the BOT reports, we'll go into our first action item of the night, the Boulder Regional Emergency Telephone Service Authority rate increase. Yep, right. so I'm gonna introduce this, but we actually have Sheriff Johnson on with us. And so I'll get this cool. started Great. and then Sheriff Johnson jump in where, where needed. Um, so before you tonight is just a conversation about the Boulder Regional Emergency Telephone Services rate increase. And so I'm just gonna give kind of a brief overview about kind of what is Bretza. So I currently serve, this is the year that Netherland gets to serve on the board. And so I currently serve and, and Nikki will serve here soon. So it's been a great opportunity to learn more about this. But just for context, um, in 1987, the Boulder Regional Emergency Telephone Service Authority was formed and they oversee the funding for the emergency call centers in Boulder County. And so that's Boulder County itself, City of Boulder and Longmont. Um, the funding for Bretza is drawn from phone users within Boulder County um, and cities and is collected monthly by phone companies from their customers. And these funds are allocated towards staffing, training, equipment, technology advancements at the emergency call centers. So again, so I got a little ahead of myself. So on this next slide, you're really looking at, you know, there's 1.7 million in 2024, and it's it's everything from, you know, the text to 911 to a series of IT technology, um, having the call centers, staffing the call centers, ensuring that those uh, dispatchers are well trained, doing a series of public alerting. This is obviously a very essential service for our community. Um, so, so currently the fee for 911 services is um, at 75 cents. And there has been a discussion about looking to increase that by 50 cents to bring it to a dollar 25. And this in turn would just allow to continuously funding and have more robust funding for all of those services. And I think, you know, again, with dispatch being such a vital service, the, the desire is to continue to train and have the right staff, you know, hopefully avoid any sort of turnover and continue to uh, invest in, in what those incredible personnel do. And so um, the state average for Bretza funding is a dollar 91. We're looking to go to a dollar 25. And so we are lower than the state, even at the 75 cents it is now, it's much lower than a lot of other um, authorities. And so we feel like this is really appropriate 
Uh, Sheriff Johnson has spoken with the Boulder County Commissioners and, and they are in support and City of Longmont appears to be in support. And so we just are going around the different jurisdictions to kind of see where you fall. Again, why is that increase? Really need it for software, hardware, and personnel. All the things that make the 911 dispatch work and function well needs to be funded. Things go up, prices go up, costs go up. And so we just need to align this fee to match um, those various increases. So tonight, what we're looking for is really two options. Do you support this or do you not? Um, obviously, as staff, strongly recommending support of this increase of 50 cents to $1.25. Um, but we'd love to turn it over to Sheriff Johnson to share anything else he'd like to add. Thanks, Miranda. Good evening, Mayor Gibbons and Nettle and Board of Trustees. Nice to see you all. Hopefully, you can hear me okay. Yeah, you sound you're coming through loud and clear. Thanks all right. So we're really trying to play some catch up and the biggest expense that Bretza funds and as sheriff, I sit on the Bretza board. I happen to be chair of the board. So I'm really coming to you tonight as chair of the board, um, seeking support for a rate increase. The statewide average, as Miranda mentioned, is much higher than what we charge in Boulder County. I took a quick look before I jumped on this meeting and for example, your neighbors in Gilpin pay $3 compared to what we're proposing to go to $1.25. And the bulk of that funding supports the technology and the background of all the 911 centers in Boulder County. And um, ultimately what this will need to lead to is a formal resolution or ordinance from the Board of Trustees in Nederland supporting it. And I can send Miranda a copy of an old county uh, resolution supporting it the last time that rates were raised, which was all the way back in 2014. So we really haven't increased in a long time. And as you all know, the cost of everything is getting more expensive, technology is more expensive, and we're adding new and cool and different technology to support communities like Nederland with alert and warning, evacuation planning, all those systems that are important when there's a crisis. So. Ultimately, what we would like to do is have resolutions in place from all of the municipalities in our county supporting it prior to about August. And then the rate increase, we have to notify the state uh, within 60 days and it would go into effect. They allow them to go into effect twice a year in February or in July. And so we would be looking to increase the rate in February of 2025. We're just doing the background work now to get all the paperwork together so that we can tell the, inform the state 60 to 90 days out from the rate increase and then make it effective next February. Any questions for me? I just have one question for both of you. So is this charged to someone who dials 911 or is this charged to everyone? It's just a fee. I actually, I can't, couldn't find anything to tell me. Who yeah, the this is when. charged on every telephone line that bills to an address in Boulder County. So whether you have a cell phone or a landline or both, you pay a fee on your bill okay. and it usually shows up as like the 911 fee. Um, that fee is on your bill and it is, you pay it to the phone company and they in turn send it back to us. That makes sense. Any, uh, any other clarifying questions? Yeah, this is Tanya. So, so it's not based on a per call, it's a monthly, Dollar twenty five charge on the bill. Correct. It's a flat fee that occurs every month for again every phone line that is billed back to an address in Boulder County. Gotcha. Okay. Thanks. Any other clarifying questions before we go to public comment? I have one. This, yep. is, this is Chris Larson. Um, you know, fully in support of this you know, just put that out there right away. But my question is, you know, you're coming to individual communities within the county looking for support. Um, you know, if we throw our support behind this tonight, sounds like Longmont might, but it, you know, say Boulder doesn't, how does this, how does our support or lack of support play into the actual enactment or, you know, raising of the fee? Great question. Um, and the answer is really in the intergovernmental agreement that exists to create Bretza back in 1987. Uh, any community can opt not to support it, but then they will receive no services from Bretza. So 
in Longmont's case, for example, they run their own dispatch center in the city of Longmont, and they calculated the cost at about $3 million to have to stand up their own dispatch center separate from the countywide Bretza funds. They would collect funds for just the city of Longmont, which is only a portion of Boulder County, and they would still need about $3 million to make up the deficit from the funding that and all the support that Bretza provides them. So if you opt out, then you are no longer a part of the Boulder Regional Emergency Service Telephone Authority. You can collect the fees yourself, but you would then be responsible for providing 911 service in your community. Is, is there kind of a correlation, like you said, Gilpin's three bucks a fee? Like, are, do small counties in general have higher fees? Yes. So there's been a lot of discussion at the state because there is tremendous inequity to the smaller counties. Yeah that still try to provide 911 services in their counties, and they have to charge a significant amount of money to run a 911 center, which has led to a lot of the consolidation. Um, for example, uh, El Paso and Teller County partner. Um, Teller is a much smaller community than El Paso County. Um, so they collect the fees over both counties, and El Paso runs the dispatch center for both counties. Other smaller counties have to charge as much as $5 Wow. Uh, to be able to make it work. We're fortunate in Boulder County that we have enough population base and enough telephones that we can use that money to benefit the entire county. Yeah. That makes sense. Thanks. And does it does it matter which county you're in when you make your 911 call as opposed to Well, yes. So a great example of that would be the town of Erie, which straddles the Boulder and Weld County line. Um, we dispatch for the Erie Police Department. So all of their 911 calls, whether you're in Weld County side of Erie or the Boulder side of Erie, route to our dispatch center. If Erie, for example, wanted to be dispatched by Weld County, they could, but they would have to pay for all the rerouting of all the phone lines that exist in Boulder County to go to Weld. Hmm. And so is that... Um relevant for us where we have like kind of you know a lot of our community is gilpin county um but they're they're still paying the higher gilpin county fee and they're going to be serviced by gilpin county's 911 correct if their address it's, is gilpin county that's where they pay you know i'm saying if they call if they call from i guess if you have a cell phone then you call from the town of netherland you call 911, but you live in Gilpin. It sounds like the cell t the towers are supposed to recognize where you are, not, not your yeah. phone, not your area code. Right. So, but that routes, I mean, if you're in Netherlands, that routes to Boulder County's emergency services, even though those people are paying Gilpin. It would, but we also have people, you know, we can't take into account, for example, a good example of that is the University of Colorado. We have 30,000 people here, a significant number of their telephones. They're paying a 911 fee in a different state, um, but we still provide service to them, knowing that we have recreationalists and people who come to our community all the time. Um, they're paying a fee somewhere, but they're getting service in Boulder County because that's where the problem is. Uh, that makes Sheriff sense. Johnson, Sheriff Johnson, I had a, a quick question more out of just curiosity. Um, I pulled up the FCC filing um, that the state has to give for their 911 funds, and it seems to break it out by whether or not it's a wireline, a wireless prepaid VoIP or other. Is is there a reason for that? I'm, I'm more out of curiosity. Well, uh, mostly because those have come into fruition. Uh, or, you know, when this started in 1987, landline was all that existed. Right. And we dealt with landline carriers. And as technology has progressed, um, even mo most recently would be the addition of prepaid. We knew that there were a significant number of people who were picking up a telephone um, that was a prepaid cell phone with service on it, and they were not paying any fee. So the FCC and the PUC at the state level corrected that by adding that to the billing matrix. So that even a prepaid cell user um, when they purchase a prepaid phone in Boulder County, pays the fee. Yeah, because they do have a different fee structure for them as well, as opposed to the other 
um, like wireless or wired type phones. So that makes sense. Um, maybe under FCC rules, but under state PUC rules, um, it's flat dollar twenty five. Hmm. It says a dollar sixty three. It says a dollar sixty three uh, for the for the um, filings in twenty twenty three. And that may have been the state average in twenty twenty three. Um, state fees by service you type. Can see it. Yeah, but anyways, so okay, so that's just helpful to understand the the nuance uh, between the different fee structure. Great, thank you. Any other clarifying questions for Sheriff Johnson or or, or Tom Administrator Fisher? If not, we'll go ahead and go to public comment. Um, this is an action item because we're deciding on a, on a fee change. Um, so if you have any public comments on this Bretza um, rate increase, now's your time. Does anyone in the room have a public comment on this 911 fee increase? Doesn't look like it, so no one in the room does. So I'll move into the folks online. If you have a public comment, please raise your hand or start, start talking. Um, if you're talking, we can't hear you, so hit star six. Um, I'm not seeing any hands up or hearing anything, so we'll go ahead and bring it back to um, the board for discussion and a motion. And maybe I'll just offer, sorry, really quick, uh, it's Miranda, just offer quick clarification. So I didn't make this an action item so that we have that motion for approval, but of course, as Sheriff Johnson noted, would bring back an official resolution to kind of like solidify that vote, um, but I think it would be great for when they go into their next Bretza board meeting to know that you have voted for approval, which is why this is an action item. Thank you. Yeah, um, I would just articulate that, you know, and the, the reason too why I pulled the FCC filings was just to see also how it looks from a state to state perspective and You'll see a lot of the dollar fifties, two dollars. Colorado is some of the highest with three dollars and nine cents. Whether again, Sheriff Johnson, whether that's an average or um, or not. Um, but it also said in the filings that this has been a persistent and consistent problem across all states is not keeping up with the technological advances, and therefore. Um, we're going to, you know, not just our community, our county, but across the board, across the United States, this is something that a lot of communities are moving forward to because there have been so many upgrades. And so um, voicing my support for this, um, you've got to invest back into the technology in order to keep people safe, public safety. So, so thanks for bringing it to us. So I move to approve increasing the breadth of rate to dollar twenty-five. I second. Any more discussion? Quick, not real quick, but do you have any any discussions or questions? Okay, Macy. Uh, Trustee Miller. Yes. Trustee Ty. Yes. Trustee Larson. Yes. Mayor Billy. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Sterling. Yes. And Trustee Corvalon. Uh, okay. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate it. Um, thanks, Sheriff Johnson. Appreciate you being here. Yes. Thanks, Sheriff Johnson. Thank you. Thanks for your time. Have a good night. Thank you. you too. So next will be our number two action item, the Wingate Minor Subdivision. All right. So tonight before you is consideration of a minor subdivision application that was submitted by the town of Netherlands. So we are the applicant uh, for the Mary Q Wingate Living Trust. And I'll get into why we're the applicant in a moment. So just for some history on this parcel, if you're not familiar, um, this parcel is kind of on the, the south side of town uh, near the Eldora turnoff. But September 14th, 2000, the town of Netherland entered into an agreement with Mary Wingate related to the transfer of the property to town. And we included that, that parcel. And so in that agreement, there was a purchase agreement as well as a gifting agreement. So some parcels were just being gifted and then other parcel, another parcel we were paying on. Um, 
in that agreement, uh, unfortunately, when Mary Wingate passed away in 2020, she actually waived the town's requirement to continue to pay on the lease parcel. And so that now all the parcels coming to town were now being gifted. Um, but we need to legally document and do an official transfer of this gift. And so in recognizing that the town is getting, you know, parcels of land as a gift, we decided we would come forward and be the applicant. And so we've been working with Lori Wingate, who I don't think was able to make it tonight, but she, we talked to her and just said, you know, if we need to go through the subdivision process for the parcel you're going to keep, do you want to subdivide it? Let's just do this all at one time. And ultimately she determined that she wanted to subdivide her parcel into four uh, separate parcels. So with her four and the three that we were being gifted, it turned it into a major subdivision. And a major subdivision was going to qu require, you know, quite a bit of, of extra work um, and really was not appropriate for what we're seeking to do. The parcels coming to town have a conservation uh, restriction on it, and so we can't develop them. And so in knowing that and in knowing that really Lori's looking to do a minor if she was kind of doing this on her own, we came to you and asked you if it would be okay to run this as a minor subdivision instead of a major. And on August 30th, 2023, the Planning Commission did recommend that we run this as a minor subdivision. And then you as a board in September also confirmed that. So that is why this is coming for you as a minor subdivision, even though it is more than four parcels being separated out. So under the minor subdivision section of code 1736, and I'm sorry, that should say the Board of Trustees, you should consider the following. Um, you need to determine that the proposed subdivision meets and satisfies all applicable requirements in the subdivision regulations. We did provide a link to that. You need to determine that the proposed subdivision conforms to all required zone districts, um, including but not limited to setbacks, heights, floor, lot area, minimum lot size, you need to confirm that it conforms to all other requirements of code, ordinances, or resolutions. You have to confirm that it has the capacity of water and sewer uh, for this site. And then that it conforms to the goals and policies of the Netherlands Comprehensive Plan. So, um, and I'm sorry, the, the proposed subdivision will not result in an unreasonable increase of peak rates of discharge or decrease in the quality of discharge. So we as staff did a little analysis just to kind of provide an assessment of those criteria. And from a yard and bulk perspective, um, it, we don't have any non-conforming lots. The way in which uh, Lori seeks to divide her parcels are large enough. Um, it's all gonna remain low density residential, which is what it is now. You need 16,000 square feet. And as you can see, these lots are anywhere from 25,000 to 280. 4,000 and some change. So these are well beyond the minimum lot size for that is required in that zone. Lori has not stated what her, her desire is. Um, there is an interest in kind of giving these parcels to her family members who may choose to develop it later with likely single family residential units. But given how large those parcels are in the subdivision, it's, they'll still be able to meet all yard and bulk standards for setbacks. From a utilities connected with utilities uh, manager Andrew Bliss, and we noted that there is water and wastewater in both areas. Utilities are located on the north side of the highway as well as Rollinsville Road. Um, it's likely though that connecting to this, uh, the utility connection off of Rollinsville would require going through private property, but there is a means to connect should future residents be developed. Again, only on Lori's parcels because there's a conservation a restriction on the ones coming to town. As, as I noted, Lori does not intend to develop, but if she were, she has reiterated verbally that she seeks to do single family residential homes. And then of course, because of the conservation easement, town cannot develop, but can do recreational um, development. So some conversations that have happened with ProSAB before these became official parcels, but we knew they were being gifted is things like trail connectivity, connecting over to Big Springs. Um, there has been some talk about, you know, downhill biking or some sort of, sort of bike recreational facility, but ultimately we'd like to see that ProSAB plays a role in kind of guiding what that development could look like. But more than anything, we're very interested in mitigating that parcel and feel like it's a prime candidate for mitigation funds to help create kind of a, a fuel break. The comprehensive plan, of course, highlights the value of open space and passive recreation. 
You also have the PROS, the Parks, Recreation, Open Space Trails Master Plan, which of course highlights in detail the desire to acquire more land, to approve trails connectivity, to have more recreational opportunities, um, and then just have an implementation of a trails network. So the Planning Commission reviewed this application last month and they unanimously voted to recommend approval. Um, at the time they did vote on 2024-16, we identified a duplication. So tonight you're voting on 2024-18. And then of course, as town staff, we've reviewed the application and we have no objections to approval as well. So kind of questions, you have questions for me. Um, and then there are a series of motions as well as the resolution in the file to be voted on. Thanks, Miranda. Any clarifying questions for Miranda? And I will um, just point out the questions before the board. Is, does the BOT wish to approve the Myra subdivision request? If so, do we have any conditions that would like to attach to the application? And then there's a series of, well, then, then there's approving the resolution. Uh, this is Tanya, I make a motion to approve the resolution. Oh, we, we, um, we, as we, is. Thanks, cool. We will have, it's an action item, so we'll need some public comment, but um, it, that, that helps me answer your take that there's no conditions that you, that you can see as there, foresee as there's a motion on the table i'll second that motion so then we can have conversation discussion after a second uh, okay cool yeah, great so we have a motion and a second and so we'll, we'll move to discuss after uh, after public comment um is there any um more clarifying questions or, or any it's, questions about conditions etc is there a map of the proposed subdivision? Yes, it's, so the plat and, and I'm happy to bring it up. It'll be real tiny up there. It's um, on page, it's on pages, you know, it's on pages. Well, at least the, the what we do have is on pages 121 and 122 of the packet. That, yes. that, 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 that doesn't show. I mean, those are just the individual lots. I mean, what do they want to subdivide? So that's this was so. So if you look at kind of prior. OK, sorry, let me pull it up on property viewer. Be easier to see it there. Yeah. Um, give me one second. Yeah, I mean, if you're looking at the Boulder County property viewer, like I've, that's what I've got up right now. Yeah. Uh, so but let me just share already... my screen so that the people online can okay. see. And then I'm sorry, Trustee Miller, probably some squinting here. So um, this parcel here, this really big parcel to the west, yep. this is what's being divided into four and remaining with Lori Wingate, if you can see where my map, my mouse is. So that's being subdivided into four separate parcels. Which are, which are already outlined in red. Well, it's just, it's just this big one. Sorry, it's okay. just this one right here. Okay, yeah, right. Well. And so that was my, my question is, is there a map of how that's split up? Yes, yeah, so that's in your packet. The lot lines are kind of hard to see, but it's on page 161 of the updated Board of Trustees agenda packet I sent out. Yeah, I was trying, that's what I was looking at. Yeah, so that's what that was. So you've got lot, oh. you have to look real close. We have lot one in the upper northwest corner. You have lot one. The next, do you see that? Uh, Here, I'm zooming in, but you may have to walk over there. Yeah, well, I've, I've got it on my screen. Uh, so lot one, all the way to the left side of the plat in the upper oh, okay. corner. Oh, it's really small. Okay. It's very small. Lot one, next to it is lot two. Then you go to lot three. And lot five are the lots that are staying with the Wingate family. And then town is acquiring lot four and lot six. So four is a, is a consolidation of the two existing lots in, that are currently Correct. separate in the Boulder County plot yep. map. Yep, yep. And then lot lot six has already been defined. It's already, but just for our clean okay. map, lot six is stays the same. Gotcha. So town town's getting lot four and lot six. Six. Right. And and there's already a structure on lot one. Is that correct? Um, lot two is lot where two. the structure okay. is. 
So there could conceivably be a conceivably be a structure on lot one and lot five and lot three. Okay. It, it, you know, and I think Lori's intention is she wants to keep these in her family. She wants these if they're developed single family, not looking to do large scale housing development, um, but has zero plans at this time. Yep. Thanks. And then this trail that I've heard people talk about, this oak, it would come down potentially through lot six and four and kind of connect yes. the, the hairpin turn or somewhere up there. Yeah, I think, for, to, uh, yeah, for us to, you know, I think as, as ProSAB and the Parks Department, we really maintain that like mitigation has to come first. These are heavily forested areas and, and the fire department's eager and so are we, but of course, until we, we own them, we're not gonna move forward. And so we're hoping to utilize these lots for grant funding. There's a lot of mitigation funding out there. Yeah, isn't there fun? I mean, can the town go for the funding the county has through that tax or is that? No, that's for property okay. owners only, but there's other options. But I think this will be a really great kind of candidate for grant funding because of how large these parcels they are. And then just that they're a big connectivity piece for town. And we really need a fuel break there. I think it'll be essential. So I'm um, excited that, you know, these are coming for us for a lot of reasons, but I think ProSAB has always maintained that mitigation will be step one. Love it. Any more clarifying questions before we go to public comment? If not, we'll go to public comment. We'll go in the room first. Anyone have any comments on the Wingate? Minor subdivision. Um, if not, we'll go ahead online. Um, anyone online have any comments you'd like to make regarding the uh, section item on the Wingate Minor Subdivision? Okay. Uh, with that, we'll bring it back to the board for any any. If there's any more discussion needed, and we have a motion, and we have um, a second. Are there any any discussion? Anything folks need to add or, or a question? I think this is one of those, you know, this is basically one of those no brainer things we eventually occasionally get, and it's great when we do because we can move right through them. But yeah, this is great. Let's do it. Sounds good. Um, so I think with that, Macy. All right, Trustee Larson. Yes. Trustee Miller. Yes. Trustee Ty. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Sterling. Yes. Trustee Corvalon. Yes. And Mayor Billy. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, so with that, we'll move to our third action item of the evening with the purchase authorization for compact excavator. Bob Cat of the Rockies. Andrew. We uh, for preventative maintenance projects, they have an emergency repairs. We need to dig up the ground to repair water mains, to replace fire hydrants, to re excuse me, repair sewer mains, etc. Um, our current excavation equipment is a 2007 uh, Caterpillar backhoe and a 1997 John Deere excavator. Um, they're both old. Um, currently, the John Deere excavator is not working, um, and there's an increasing amount of maintenance that's needed. And um, when we need to use the equipment, we need to use it quickly, especially in emergencies. And so uh, we want to make sure we have uh, reliable equipment. And this is part of a larger project that we budgeted um, for this year where we're evaluating all kinds of different water and wastewater equipment, um, critical equipment, um, looking at old equipment, making sure we have spares for critical pumps, replacing uh, pumps and air compressors that are due for replacement. And um, part we evaluated, um, you know, putting money into the backhoe, putting money into the excavator, and um, we thought it was best to buy a mini excavator. And um, I budgeted for a used mini excavator, but we've learned through the process that, um, you know, buying a used ex mini excavator without a warranty kind of raises additional issues. So um, I'm asking the board to um, purchase a new ex mini uh, compact excavator 
that's about this a little bit bigger than our backhoe and it's and smaller than our excavator um and it's really necessary talking to many um, local excavators it's the size that we need for the depth of mains we have and um asking the board that you know we budgeted some amount for this uh, this year but not enough for the full amount for a new one so asking the board if you're willing to commit to budgeting um, a second payment for the excavator so we'll pay the first payment out of our current year this year's budget and then we're asking you to commit to budgeting um, next year for the second um, second payment which includes uh, some interest that so they're financing basically the second payment for us thanks andrew any questions for andrew um, I, I have one, and this is Tanya, and I'm sorry if this is already in the packet. This comes out of the water budget, though, when we put it in our budget next year, not the general fund. A combination of the water and the, and the sewer budget, correct? Right. Okay. Thank you so much. And did you say that the town already has some Bobcat equipment? Yes, we, as part of this um, project, we purchased a compact track loader, a skid steer earlier this year. Um, it's, it's been working very well for us and, um, Bobcat's been servicing it very well. We found, you know, this is probably getting into the weeds, but John Deere and Caterpillar dealers, they really service very big equipment and construction companies that have a ton of equipment. We found with Bobcat, they, uh, tend to be, give us a little bit more attention than the other dealers because they tend to service smaller businesses. Hey, Andrew, um. I, I didn't notice any type of maintenance, like contract or maintenance fees associated with it. You guys are doing that separately, or that's not something that you buy up front and get a discount on. Right. Um, correct. No, we did not. Um, so the, um, the, I believe the first uh, maintenance due, if we purchase this, would be in five hundred hours. We would do um, every every. 10 hours or eight of every eight hours, uh, we have to grease um, joints and we have to check uh, coolant levels and we have to deal with, you know, uh, things that are, need repair under warranty or if it's our fault, we have to repair them. Um, but in terms of regular maintenance, um, the, the first interval would be 500 hours. And I don't anticipate hitting that 500 hours interval this year. Um, so that would be something we would budget as part of our operating budget for next year. Okay, but it's not it's not like a package or anything that they offer and we get a discount on it. No, no, I've I've talked to um the the John Deere, Caterpillar, and Bobcat salespeople pretty extensively. Okay. Uh, nothing nothing really came out. Um I'm happy to inquire with it, but um I, I don't I don't think it's really necessary. We get a warranty. Um we can, you know, we've had discussions that we could do the preventative maintenance. Um, in house, or we could pay them to do it, but no pro, no um, kind of package deal came out of that. I will note that Bobcat um, is unique in that it offers a trade in pro program for government agencies. Um, we're not uh, fully committed to doing that trade in program, um, but it is an option to us where we pay an annual fee. We basically pay the depreciation on the machine, and then every two years um, they switch out a similar spec machine, brand new, for our existing machine. Um, so it keeps us in warranty, keeps us with a new machine, and we'll pay the the depreciation every year. All right, cool. Thanks. You mentioned in here that this is utilities purchasing the Bobcat, and you're currently sharing with Parks and, and uh, Streets on the John Deere and the Caterpillar, which you it's also the high, you know, they're old. They have high expenses to keep them running. Um, is this one going to then, is the new Bobcat going to be then shared with parks and streets as well so that they will be able to retire some of these older equipment or is it just for utilities? Yeah, we, we always try to share stuff. You know, I'd like to have first, right of first refusal, um, especially in an emergency, but we try to share that they're great about it. We try to be great about it, sharing everything um, as much as we can. That's what I wanted to hear. <laughs> Any more clarifying questions for Andrew? If not, we'll go to public comment. Um, anyone in the room have any comment on on this purchase, Bobcat? 
If not, anyone online have, have a comment about this? Hearing none or seeing no hands up, um, we'll go ahead and bring it back to the board for discussion and a motion. I don't see a uh, specific language, but I uh, let, let, let me let me get it for you right now. It's on page. Um, sorry, I'd moved away. So, oh, sorry, I screwed up. I, think it's I don't think we I don't put think it. Sorry. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. sorry, I was just gonna sorry, say. Andrew. <laughs> I did not add it to the aim. Okay. And I think no worries. Your motion would be just really the yeah. question before the board yeah. just converting that to a motion. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I, I move to approve uh, budgeting for a second payment of the compact excavator in 2025 at the cost of sixty-one thousand one hundred ninety-three dollars. Second. Any discussion? Any more questions? Macy? Trustee Ty? Yes. Trustee Miller? Yes. Trustee Larson? Yes. Mayor Billy? Yes. Trustee Corvalon? Yes. And Mayor Pro Tem Sterling? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank and you all. Appreciate it. Oh, anytime. I, before Miranda leaves, I want Miranda to, to drive it as well. So we'll have a little demo day. That'd be great. Awesome. So with that, we will move into our, um, we have three discussion items this evening. The first one is the XL power outage debrief. Um, I do believe Miranda. Yep. Uh, you all know this, but I'm going to tell you anyways, the first weekend of April, Excel took the proactive step of shutting the power off in the town of Netherland and surrounding areas due to heightened winds and risk of wildfire. Um, when I was speaking with Mayor Billy, really thought it would be helpful for the community to know what steps town staff took. And I gave you a giant play by play, and, and I just want to give you kind of the highlights of this. Um, Mainly just acknowledging that myself and Troy Hendricks, who's on the call as well, uh, Troy Hendricks is our emergency court administrator. We were the main points of contact for the Office of Disaster Management. We participated in all of the emergency operation um, center calls. Um, I then kind of served as point of contact with department heads, and we all remained in consistent communication from the moment we found out about it to really that that kind of Tuesday morning when everything was shutting down. And so. I think my biggest highlight I just want to do is that kind of a huge shout out to staff. Staff just knew what to do, knew what to do right away. Andrew left a little too early. Um, Andrew and team just obviously knew all of our facilities run off of generators, and he and his team were really all over it. Almost 800 gallons were estimating of diesel fuel went into these generators, and every two to three hours, the team had to go back out and make sure that they were um, fueled up. And so it was kind of a constant round the clock operation. But huge shout out to, ta to town staff. It really feels like it clicked together seamlessly. Um, we also attempted to maintain you know, pretty good communication with the community, but identified some takeaways. So I'm just going to hit those really quick and then happy to answer any questions you have. From a communication standpoint, we really utilize Facebook. Um, Facebook is a huge means of communication for our community, but received some feedback that it would have been helpful to utilize Everbridge. So for clarification, the town has its own Everbridge account, which is separate from the county. So the county's Everbridge account you sign up for for countywide alerts. But the town has one that we can push out messages saying, hey, we're working on the, a main break in your area or we're going to you know, do some culvert work and we can alert and really target a specific area and send out an alert. We unfortunately are still working on getting that whole system set. So it wasn't the right means because it would have missed large chunks of the community, but working on getting our system to a place where we can send out mass messages. And so the phone numbers associated with our Everbridge account are phone numbers associated with your water bill. So if you don't have a util phone number with your utility bill, we strongly encourage you to do that. And we're gonna push out some messaging about how to sign up for that. But that's how we'll push messages out. We also noted that we probably should have been a little bit clearer about our communication about the community center. There was some question about why were we not a shelter. We really served as a warming shelter from typically eight to eight, but we never received any sort of messaging in our direct communication with ODM and other parties like law enforcement and fire department that we ever really needed to activate as an overnight shelter. 
Activating as an overnight shelter is not just opening up the doors. If you're going to call for an official overnight shelter, you need to have the right pieces in place, the right personnel in place to truly run a shelter, which for us would have required pulling up Red Cross. And we were really mindful that we didn't want to reallocate resources to Netherland if that need wasn't there. So we trusted our partners with law enforcement and fire to provide that guidance. And you kind of will read throughout here. We had staff on standby on call, but at never any point where we pulled in to activate a shelter here, but we were a warming shelter. And while some of the Facebook messages you see, we say we're open so you can get warm and you can charge your devices. We probably could have been a little bit clearer in our terminology. We did identify, however, that Red Cross is there for support only in our current IGA, and they don't actually activate the shelters. Well, from a capacity standpoint, we don't have enough staff to fully activate shelters, especially when half our crew is out filling generators all day long. So we really need to renegotiate that IGA so that Red Cross activates the shelter and doesn't just come up to support our staff. So Don's going to take the lead to talk to the Red Cross uh, personnel to get that IGA updated, and we'll bring it back to you in the near future. Generator reimbursement, we'd love to get reimbursed for that. That was a huge expense that we were not prepared for. We contacted our insurance. Unfortunately, it's not a covered expense. Um, I did ask Excel in a, in a debrief I with Excel, just like this is, you know, like a lot of people, there are a lot of expenditures that came with this decision that communities like ours really struggle to absorb. And so, of, of course, realize that that's a shot in the dark, but put it out there. But I think for us, we really identified how valuable a portable generator is going to be. Um, we, you know, it's it's just going to be essential for all of our different equipment. So Andrew's going to come to you in 2025. Um, we we will be fine if this event happens again with the current plan in place. But it would just be a great added resource. We also are really glad it didn't snow because the gates, the doors for the public workshop are so heavy that to be able to manually pull those open to get our equipment out of the garages to plow on top of all this would have been very challenging. So this is all just about reconfiguring the way the generators uh, power electricity through the building and mainly focuses on the upstairs and ensuring that there's heat in the area that a lot of town staff sleep if they have to, but we should be able to reconfigure so that we can have those gate, the garage doors open should we need to pull out equipment. So I'm kind of glad it didn't snow, but realize that that would have been a huge issue had that been the case. And I got a lot of questions about the microgrid. If you've been at the community center recently, you know we have a microgrid just right outside, but it's not hooked up. It's not online yet. Unfortunately, we're running into a couple issues. It was supposed to go online before the major snowstorm. They were supposed to come up. It snowed. They couldn't come up. Um, and then, of course, this happened. So we're not active yet. But the hope is that it'd be able to maintain community power. And when I say that, I'm not necessarily saying all of town. You know, I think we have to be realistic that we won't really know the, the kind of the span of this microgrid until it fully comes online. And so more to come. But former Mayor Pro Tem Mahol did write an article about the microgrid, and I linked that in the article. But I think Excel is going to be coming up here to hook, get that online, basically. Correct. Yep. Um, but I think ultimately between this and actually the major snowstorm, we identified, you know, that some individuals are not prepared for major events. And so there's a little bit of a community resiliency that Troy and I have talked a bit about, and we actually are going to partner with Boulder Watershed Collective on pushing out the messaging. You budgeted $10,000 for emergency preparedness and mitigation outreach. Um, we're a little behind on getting that done, but Boulder Watershed Collective, um, did receive a grant and so we can kind of maximize those financial resources and really help the community understand that you should be prepared for long-term outages and here's how you'll do that you should be prepared for major snow events and that while we are here to help you as your local municipality it is not our responsibility to come in and, and kind of immediately jump to there has to be a threshold in which community members can be resilient on their own before the town's sheltering and before the town's jumping into a, a more robust emergency action. Um, in the town of Netherland, people were without power a little over 24 hours. I think we're at like 30 ish hours and, and someone should be able to be self sufficient for that period of time. Obviously, it became a little bit more concerning for me, even though this is, is in our jurisdiction when Eldora and Ridge Road started going on 50 hours. 
that's when we really wanted to be good partners to our fellow neighbors and try to figure out what can we do for them. But Nederland, for the time that Nederland itself was out, we'd like to see that community members really take these two recent events and really look at their emergency preparedness plan and assess, can you do future long-term outages or major snow events? Um, I don't know what the future holds. You see that in the letter from Excel, you know, they're doing their own evaluations, but you know, they are bringing forward these planned outages, how they happen. You know, people have asked me, well, is there a threshold? If it's so windy, will they do this? I have yet to receive any guidance from them about a threshold of when this would happen. Um, so again, just want to reiterate that community resiliency. But what I can assure you is that your town staff are ready to go. They know how to handle these emergencies. They did an incredible job and they will do so again if or when this happens. So happy to answer any questions you might have. If you have any recommendations, I also encourage you to maybe consider perhaps, you know, selecting some board members to write a letter to the Colorado Public Utilities Commission on behalf of the town of Nederland. Um, town staff can work with you on that, but but of course here to answer any questions you may have. One more thing I'll put out there is we got, the BOT got an email today uh, from um, a representative with the P Colorado PUC, which means Public Utilities Commission. And um, there is a meeting tomorrow night and we can, we are free, I, I checked back with them, we are free to share that with the public that is a wide open public meeting. You, you can actually sign up, register to speak at it and or just listen. But I will, um, we, we will get that out um, on Facebook and post it so folks can uh, know how to log in because that would be talking directly to the state tomorrow, which is really going to make a much bigger difference than talking to the Board of Trustees. Um, um, yes. Uh, does town have plans to send any anybody down for that? I'm or not going. I got to watch the kids, but to, I'm, I'm going to log in, but I'm not going. Just to go anywhere. But <laughs> I mean, do, do we have any intention to have just like a town representative for that meeting? Not that I know of. At the moment, because that you are you volunteering? That email, Luke? Gotta love it. <laughs> Trusty Miller. Um, that email did just come through today, so I have yet to chance to kind of really look at it myself or with our team. Happy to kind of work with the group to see if someone can head down there. Um, it's at 4 p.m., which is kind of an awkward time. It is. Yeah. You, yeah, I think as I, I can be there. Or are you sure? Can be there. One of us will be there. Me or Andrew. Yeah. And it's, I it's, hesitate to throw you guys in there because it's like four until everyone who has. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's going to be, you might get a hotel room down there <laughs> because it's going to be we long. All would join virtually as well. Yeah, because she, she did say, you know, when I asked her today if we could share this publicly, she said it's they, they're posting it and they want people to get it the word out. So I expect there'll be lots of people talking. But they also in this email note that comments are welcome anytime on their online platform, cool. which is, I guess, as a part of me is encouraging you as a board, yeah. maybe to select 1 or 2 people to work on a letter to send. Might and again, we can also send it directly to Robert, who's the president of the Colorado division instead of going. I mean, this is a great portal and I would maybe argue this is a great portal for the community and that you have more direct. Access and you may want to utilize those. Robert with Excel. Mm -hmm. Robert Henny, who's the president of the Colorado Excel division. Um, Miranda, I just had a comment. This is Tanya. Um, I 100% agree that community members should be able to withstand 36 hours of power outage without it becoming any kind of an emergency. Um, Knowing that we are emergency services are available if there were an emergency, of course, but I would like to say that opening that community center on Sunday. Was a very welcome move and it was really good for building community. I mean, I saw the big TV was on in the senior lounge playing sports. A bunch of the, the teens and the kids were down there uh, congregating playing and. Um, I mean, I'm sure there was a lot of other stuff going on. I'm, I didn't personally go in, but I did go pick up my teen and. I think um, that kind of action, even though it's not necessary, is a really good thing to do. And I encourage you to do it at, at all the times that 
because you have the generator and it's just a way to bring the community together and anything that we can do that's positive that can build community is and get people off their phones or you know like out and about together i think is really important so i thank you for doing that and the i think the community center in particular for um, doing that yeah, thanks, Trustee Garvalon. I actually just did a debrief with Don right before this meeting in our one on one, and we agreed that we're going to develop a policy that that says instead of having to make that call that day, which to, to your point was kind of a no brainer for us, that the policy is just going to state that in the event of a power outage, the community center will be open on a Sunday from 8 to 8. That's great. Thank you. I have a question, maybe a little bit off topic, but the generator that is behind Netherland Elementary School going up to Caribou Ridge, is that a town generator? And yes. It's loud. Do we have any thoughts about that generator? It's old. Um, yeah, we have lots of thoughts about that generator. That generator is really old. Um, we'd love to replace it, and it comes at a pretty high cost. So we actually ended up having to do a temporary generator last year, which cost us a ton of money. And so um, it's just a capital improvement project that, that didn't really fall into this year's. But yes, we are interested in replacing that generator. Um, we do have a lot of challenges with that generator. Yeah, just given that, it, you know, it goes every Tuesday at nine and being a, uh, a close proximity resident, it's, uh, it's pretty bad. If you ever want to tour, that generator is massive. Also, it would be real hard to get it out from under the ground, but uh, where is it? Where is it? It is Ridge. underground in between uh, Caribou Ridge and Netherland Elementary. It's, oh. So uh, the the development agreement with Caribou Ridge, they put in that generator and then the town took it over. But unfortunately, it's been kind of nothing but problems for us. Um, but the cost of replacement is pretty hefty. Have you, what is the cost of replacement? Just curious. I don't have that data in front of me. I don't have access to the server right now. Would, I could, would come, that be the I could get back to you. Sorry, was yes. that, would that be Caribou Ridge's responsibility to replace it if it was never no. good in the first place? It transferred to the town, and so it's the town's responsibility. Is that used for the sewage and the water pump? Is that what it's for? Or well, it yeah, for I mean, it's, a, it's the generator for the pump station. That, right. that is in Caribou Ridge, yeah. And so under the development agreements after Caribou Ridge, you know, developed certain things, there was a transition that those then became town owned assets. And so the, it is the town's responsibility. And trustee or Mayor Pro Tem Sterling, we can get back to you with that cost, uh, but I know it's gonna be a part of your 2025 budget discussions. Yeah, I think also we should consider that there's, there's probably a pretty significant environmental mm -hmm. impact of that generator that I would not wanna see the town get uh, hit with something. What do you mean? Like sewage backing up or something? Is that what you're talking about? No, it, it just, it just blows out black smoke. Like, like, uh, kind of the oldest diesel bulldozer you could imagine. Oh, really? Oh, it's horrible. Yeah. Any more, any more um, qu questions or comments on this? I mean, I think I saw a lot of people saying, I, I was out of town. <laughs> My wife wasn't, though. She was here with one of our kids. And, um, and I definitely saw a lot of, um, I was checking in online with Facebook, and there was, a great post by Deb Dandridge just kind of saying, hey, this is what you do and kind of giving people some knowledge up front and a lot of good collaboration and knowledge. And, um, you know, a lot of people really did well and other people you know, struggled more. Um, and I think all the people saying this is likely going to happen more and more often is something to be ready for. That, that is, I, I agree with that. So, um, and yes, um, we will we will definitely be tuning in or you know I'll telling people about how to get on to tomorrow's meeting with the PUC and feel free to contact us with your comments too as we figure how to message upward. Hey hey Billy, sorry, this is Tanya real quick. I liked your post, but referencing somebody else's um isn't great. I think you should copy paste and give them credit for the points that you'd like to 
um, highlight because not everybody has access to everybody on Facebook. Ah. And um, or maybe your search isn't, you know, you put in somebody's name, it doesn't show up. I mean, it's not as easy as just go look at this post. So I think if there were five key points from it, you could definitely credit her or, you know, but it would be nice to have them in your post just for future. Thank you. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, with that, is there any, um, any more comments? on the power outage thanks a bunch i appreciate you guys did a good debrief and yeah i was i wasn't community i was out of town but i was in communication with miranda and i i know that she there were she was regularly on the all those odm meetings um Having for days 12 <laughs> Sorry, and I yeah. together and with excel and i think you said the county commissioners were on that meeting with you and a bunch of others um, with that, we'll move on to our num our second discussion item, the term rental ordinance amendment. Um, Macy. All right. Um, so this evening we'll talk about the short term rental code amendments that have been recommended and a little bit about the history about what this has gone through so far. Um, so in August of 2023, the board discussed changes that were needed to the short term rental code. Specifically, the conversation focused on some of the challenges town staff are navigating with regards to thing like to things like the 2 primary license types. The board's desire to exploring capping licenses and community feedback that short term rentals should have fire bans and bear proof trash cans as well as ways to communicate directly with short term rental owners. The board provided direction to work on short term code short term rental code amendments to address the following goals. The 1st goal that was established was to limit the number of housing stock converted to short term rentals. Following the completion of the housing needs assessment, there is a clear need for long term rentals or home ownership instead. The 2nd established goal is to ensure that short term rentals are operating in a very safe manner and are respectful of the neighborhood in which they operate. The third established goal is to provide a means for neighbors to work with short term rental owners on their concerns and improve that line of communication. And the fourth established goal is to simplify administration of the license process for efficient use of town staff time. So, since October 2023, a subcommittee has been formed, which includes chair Williams and commissioner Herring town staff and town attorney Madsen. And we have been working on short term rental code changes that specifically address these problems. In February of 2024, we took our recommendations to the planning commission and they recommend they recommended that we move forward with option 1. Option 1 um, has 1 license type. And town staff feel that going with 1 license type and capping the number of licenses is the simplest way to handle licensing. This license structure best addresses all four goals identified as reasons to amend the licensing schedule. And this types of license structure also allows the town the opportunity to provide short term lodging for visitors and to collect sales tax and occupation lodging tax. And it would allow property owners to short term rent rooms in order to earn additional income. So here's a little table about the the requirements that we would have and it would be one license type it they would we would have a primary residence requirement there would be a cap on the total number of short term short term rental licenses that are allowed within town limits i have established a notification system for neighbors of licensed short term rentals um, the short term rentals would be required to have a bear proof trash container and there would be a fire ban implemented at the short term rentals. Another thing is that they would have a minimum of 4 documented stays per year. I have a yeah. stupid question. No. Is that on what's what I don't understand that last 1, the minimum yeah. stay. So um, there are a handful of short term rental license holders that hold a license, but they don't actively rent rooms or rent the home as a short term rental. They hold the license all year. So I reach out on a quarterly basis to obtain tax payments from them. They submit to me a tax form that says they have had no rentals. I then compare that to the compliance software. Um, so it 
takes staff time to track a license, even though it's not actively being used. Um, since 2024, we have implemented a regulatory fee that does offset a lot of that work. Um, but so the reason I'm recommending this is because if we implement a cap and only allow 60 short term rental licenses to be held, then to me, it doesn't make sense to allow a license to be held by someone who's not actively using it and then have somebody uh, waiting on a wait list for a license for who knows how long. So that's the reasoning for the minimum stays. That makes sense. Awesome. Okay, so in March of 2024, the planning commission was presented with two ordinances. Um, so it was all under the one license type structure and had all these regulations that I previously mentioned. But one ordinance would allow for the owner or tenant of a property to obtain the short term rental license. And then the other ordinance, which is the one that's being presented to you this evening and the one that was ultimately recommended by the planning commission is the, a license type that allows only the owner who is also a primary resident to obtain the short term rental license. So if you have any questions, Macy, this is Tanya. yes. Why did you guys scratch out in the resolution all the different things that are required to prove a primary resident? Um, we just moved it around and we oh, it's actually, a different spot. yes, it is. And we actually added, uh, I believe two more, at least one more requirement for primary. Where residents. did you move it? So I can look at it. It's 696. Thank you. Uh, section a five and now they have oh, to gotcha. show. Got it. What's the extra thing just for real quick? Um, well, so right now un under this um, ordinance, they will now have to sh provide a Colorado driver's license or an ID with their Netherland address and at least two of the following, which would be a voter mo motor vehicle registration, voter registration, sales tax return, or a utility bill. Um, and are we going to ask them? I thought one of the ideas floating around was to have them show it like twice a year because, or every year at least, are we going to, because we know that people will do these things and then they'll change it once they get the license. Yes, since we have talked about that, since this came to the board of trustees last, I have changed the requirements so that they, they submit proof of residency annually. And so I check it upon their license renewal. So we're, we're requiring it at the time of application and then one year later when they're reapplying for the license, we're requiring it again. Okay, great, thank you. And while I got you, one more question. Um, there, so there's no longer a restriction of only six months rental. People can rent 365 now, or I, I'm just not seeing anything about the time a person can rent. I know the minimum amount, but what's the maximum? You're correct. There is no, um, there's no, they have no requirement or limit on how many days that they can rent. Um, yeah, I think in under the definitions, primary residence still does say that they, it is their primary principal domicile for more than six months out of each calendar year. So wouldn't that imply that they can't rent it for more than six months? Oh, or it could be a host present. Okay, so, but so we are then opening the door to somebody renting you know, calling it their primary residence, but renting it 360 nights. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Where would they come up with the cap of 60? What, I mean, get percentage -wise. based on a percentage of the housing stock and it was right in between eight or 10. I can't remember exactly. Do you, do you, either of you remember exactly how much 60 licenses? I, I thought it was 10% right now, but I'm sorry. I know. I think we have 720 current housing units. Hmm. I think it's in 1 of these aims. Hold on. It's in the okay. aim. I couldn't see. Oh, yeah. Was it aim? Okay. Yeah. So the aim notes. I don't know if it's in, I don't know if we kept it in this aim though. I think it's in a different aim. Yeah, I think so. I see the number. I couldn't see where it came from. Oh, you know what? I think it was in the PC aim. 
Yeah, it is in the PC. Yeah. Sorry. So 8% of 720 is 57. Correct. And so we kicked it up to um 10 percent to give wiggle room so that it's not just capped you know so there's an ability to for people to still come forward and and apply before it moves into kind of that holding space you kicked it you kicked it up to 60, 60. so like not quite eight percent or a little over eight little so over um how many how many do number. we have right now yeah i thought we had like 65. how many do we have we have so at the time this all started we had about 56 but I have had, I've had a few of them give up licensure during the moratorium. Um, I've had two very recently, so I'd have to give you a new count, but I would estimate about, we have currently 54, 55 licenses. Yeah, I think it said in one of the aims that there were six openings still available. Mm -hmm. And so, so we're not quite at that 10% mark and m my question is where because it varies all across the United States in terms of where these percentages lie so where was sort of the decision process and where we landed on just like that over 8% what was the thought process um it was just determined in uh, the last time i spoke with the board that 10 the 8 to 10% was a good number to because we're sacrificing housing stocks so they only wanted to sacrifice about 10 percent of the housing stock but of course that's up for discussion so we could reduce it if we wanted to sure well it's not even yeah or, or or we could put it as a percentage so that as housing stock increases the number could increase sure yes well, and but I think that's one of the reasons or where I read that you all are recommending not doing that just to kind of keep it clean and simple. Yeah, right. I, mean, I think, you know, I, I spending every year to, to determine, you know, what came on, what was demolished. I mean, right. it, it, that's a lot of administrative work to kind of go back and, and determine where something falls in its permits. I mean, our preference is to just have a flat number and not recalculate every year. Agreed now, however, we're somewhere. So if we fall somewhere between that 8 to 10%, basically on the high end of 10%, we'd be looking at 72 mm -hmm. as our cap um, versus potentially a 60, which is gives us 6 openings as of right now. Okay. Correct. And the planning commission actually liked that, that, you know, you have all of your current license alert going forward, but if there are people kind of waiting, watching to see what happens, it still leaves up the six before again, you have, you've met the cap and now people are on a wait list. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because I think the preference is to not, the preference at the time of the going for the, for the planning commission was to not go immediately into a wait list. Because you've, you've got people who maybe have chosen not to apply because they want to see what's happening. And if they waited, you know, unfortunately, the moratorium's been in place and they've been waiting. We, I think the feeling was that we didn't want to give them no opportunity than just be get your name on a wait list because we went straight from moratorium to wait list. This gives a bit of that kind of cushion for people to get their applications in. You know, got it. You know why they didn't go with like 70 or 65? I, I, that was the the sixty was the, the the staff recommendation. That's been our staff recommendation the whole time, and and they felt comfortable. And I think ultimately the question came down to, is it the flat rate or the percentage? And and they like the flat rate. And and I wouldn't say there was any bigger discussion about the sixty because that's always been our recommendation. So how long does that flat rate last? Excuse me, last. Um, is this something we, we, you know, you don't want to assess it every year, but we assess it every five years and. Yeah, I think you know, the, the board could amend this ordinance whenever you wanted to, to sure. increase it, you know, as you saw more housing come online, if you want right. but I think that's why we didn't want to constantly be recalculating. I think it, it would just be for us. We felt it was better to in say, 5 years, come forward and kick that up by amending your ordinance. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I can see that being a big hassle every year when we're not growing fast enough for the need for that. But. Um, so, a, a clarifying question that I've got, and this kind of relates to the letter um, that Judy had written in. So, let's say there is a repeat offender, you know, just for giggles here. 
um, who in, who determines if they are indeed an offender and what happens like I don't didn't really see any consequence built in. Um, so curious as to what the conversations have been around that. Yeah, so um, every uh, concern or complaint about a short term rental is directed to me and of course evidence and photographs and everything is helpful but i also need it in written form um, i can accept a phone call of course and talk somebody through it and we can follow up via email and get writing in that way but um so i need a written complaint with pictures and photographs if possible um and then I, in the, if somebody's, it depends on what the complaint entails. A lot of the complaints don't require me to work further with other town departments and I can resolve it with the property owner on the phone or via email during our first communication and we can come up with a creative alternative to satisfy all parties. Um, if the complaint requires more information then i will collaborate with other town departments to determine the validity of the complaint um if the complaint is determined valid and a violation is required then there is a structure that we have outlined for that and it's in place now and it is in place in this uh proposed ordinance as well and maybe so, I could just add, you know, a little bit for this specific situation is, and and, many, and some others is, is you, of course, you end up with a bit of these he said, she said situations, which why, to Macy's point, we need that documentation. And, and we have encouraged um, people who maybe are experiencing some of these like overnight issues when our team is obviously not around to contact law enforcement. And that has happened at times. And then we follow up with Boulder County Sheriff's Office to take a look at their records to determine um, what they have, de if they've deemed a violation or not. And in some of these circumstances, they have not. And so that's, you know, again, it goes back to having documentation. We cannot just violate just because a uh, base on that, he said, she said, and I know that's hard, but we really value having as much documentation as possible to take this. So there's in the, in the ordinance, there's the violation um, section of code. And then it also talks about how the clerk has the ability to suspend in section 6101. And so there's a, a suspension and then there's also the administrative penalties that can be applied. And how did how did staff come up with the numbers, the dollar values for those penalties? They've been approved via the fee schedule. Um, they were recommended at the end of 2023, moving into 2024. They were, I if I remember correctly, those fees were just increased by twenty five dollars each. Yep. No. Yeah. The, uh, the, yeah. When they went through our review at the end of the year, totally. I think so. Um, I, I just. Right. Well, I know they went through a bigger jump from what was originally approved. Maybe you're right that it didn't happen last year, but they they were smaller when this ordinance was first approved. Right, and just and the reason I'm asking both just because it you know sort of fifteen hundred dollars and twenty five cents or fifteen <laughs> one thousand five hundred and twenty five dollars just seems sort of a random number, but yes, um, yes, but also you know one hundred seventy five dollars. You know, a lot of these people who are renting out their short term rentals are making way more than that per night. So mm -hmm. it, the the first offense violation seems kind of inconsequential if you have a successful Airbnb. So I don't know how much we're disincentivizing people in that one. And and also where can we find the structure for like repeat offenders? Like um cancel that. Yeah, it's on Luke's computer. So I would like to see Macy a fourth thing that is not just a 12 month thing, but a cumulative sort of, if there has been multiple violations within a five years or two years, like, cause does it just roll back over to zero every year? Um, well, so I actually haven't had to reach that point with somebody yet in the past oh. three years that I've been managing short term rentals. The only violations I've had to issue was a 1st violation and then they never repeated that behavior again. And I never had to violate them again, so I've been able to manage it, but. Yeah, I would, 
I would take all of that into consideration upon the time of renewal. If it was a person that I've had to issue violations to or somebody that I'm having trouble obtaining quarterly tax payments from, I'm definitely going to be taking that into consideration upon renewal. And it says like with renewal, it says the pro property has been subject of a nuisance violation. So is that just one and they don't get renewed? Is that because that's also quite an incentive there is that they would lose their at which point is it the third one that they lose their license? Or they lose it at the, the third, third one. The third yeah, one. I would like to see something that goes past a year so that if this, somebody has more than four Two offenses and then you know, five years. Sure. Something mm -hmm. just or, or something. I, I'm just putting out a number, but I just I think that something this doesn't just start over at the beginning of the year. Sure. Well, and, and something that impacts their renewal process. If they've had a violation yeah. last year, when they come up for renewal, there's some additional something that they have to do, or additional fees, or something mm -hmm. like that. Yeah, or the potential to lose the ability to apply for a license for a year. So I, I don't know. Just throwing it out there. Yeah. Um, oh, you mean like like a like a Time out for yeah. Yeah, for that, sure. That's a good idea. Except, what about if there's a cap, then people on the wait list? Yeah, they lose their spot. Well, uh, that's part of yeah. being a good neighbor and being a but, good. A but good for a year, year, and then they get it, and then they get it back. Well, they get it, and then they would get a chance to reapply. But I, I feel like that would really, is uh, for me, that would really lay down the law. Be like, oh, okay, I really got to check myself. Like, yeah, because I mean. You know, unfortunately, people have a tendency to repeat history, and they just will keep doing it. The third violation does include a one thousand five hundred twenty-five dollar fine, and the license is revoked, and they lose the ability to reapply for one year. Okay. Okay. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. Sorry, I'll read. No, that's okay. No, but but that's it's only so within hot. a twelve-month period. I, I'd like to see that yes. within. A 24 month period or something. I understand. I mean, so if they don't yeah. hit three violations within the time that they renew. Right. I mean, they should, don't just go back just, to one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's like a video game. All of a sudden you get all your lives back after one year. Mm -hmm. No. Well, I, so I haven't gotten to that point, but I don't assume that like, just if I'm on violation two with someone and then. We're now renewing, they're on a new license and they violate again. I'm going to be on violation three with them. Mm -hmm. So, um, with the person who wrote this letter, no, none of that have actually been proven. They're all just speculation. Because it sounds like there's a lot of repeat offending going on at that house, but it's just like you said, he said, she said. Yeah, yeah, I, I guess I, I want to be mindful of, of kind of this person, but I think that we have struggled to have enough documentation to demonstrate the violations because we're not getting it from law enforcement. Um, and then the, the reports that we're getting, we don't have a means to kind of prove validity. And so that's that is one of the challenges we're really navigating with this specific property. And I would also add that, you know, our intention, our goal has always been to work with the short term rental owner. And so there have been some circumstances with with this owner where, you know, maybe it's if it's a trash thing or something else in which Macy contacts and the owner takes the right actions to address. And so we, of course, want to give people an opportunity. But but this one is is has been very hard and complex and we have worked very closely with law enforcement on this matter. Any more clarifying questions? Can, for? I, can I just I, add I something? Yeah, I, I'm just reading the, the renewal part of the. Um, license and Macy has a lot of discretion in terms of renewing a license. So, um, the licensee has to demonstrate the minimum four documented stays that the property has not been in violation of the article of the short term rental license or article that the property um, has not had their license suspended and then th that they have not been subject of a nuisance violation conviction or plea of guilty and when we're talking about nuisance we're talking about a different section of the code that relates to like weeds 
stockpiling those types of things. We're not talking about violations of the short-term rental section. And so if any one of those conditions are not satisfied, the town clerk may deny the renewal um, application. So even for one violation for a 175 um, penalty, she has the authority to deny a renewal application as it's drafted right now. So, so I see that as good and bad um, because, and this isn't about you, it's about any town clerk. Suppose there's just bad blood that's starting to develop and, and, and it just seems like it, it, there needs to be more objective criteria. Well, then, then there's, you know, and, and maybe there's this, like, there's this ability to kind of say, you know, there's, there's a reason, but, but it just seems like there needs to be more objective criteria. Go ahead. I'm sorry. So then the licensee, if the licensee is denied a renewal license, that person can appeal the town clerk's decision to the board of trustees. Okay. So that's 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 a check. Yeah. Um, uh, I have. Go ahead. No, go ahead. It's someone. Someone out there. You're. you're oh, please. this go is ahead, Tanya. Tanya. I, I have two questions that are related to each other. Um, I feel like commercial properties. While I still believe there should only be one short-term rental on a property or per owner. I think that the commercial property should not count towards the cap because they are by definition of commercial property in an area where they can do these sort of businesses. It's not, you know, in a quote unquote like residential neighborhood, although some commercial properties tend sometimes are by weird zoning. But I, I feel like maybe that shouldn't count towards the 60. And I know you guys are trying to make things easier, but I don't necessarily think that that's always the best way to go. And I kind of feel the same way about the renting out a room in your house. If you're owner present and you are looking to make some money because times are tough and there's already a limit, it already reached our 60 and now you can't rent out one room in your three bedroom house, short term rental. That seems a little restrictive um, for our residents because here we are where we're, we're pretty good. We're getting kind of loose on whole house rentals now. They can do 365 really, you know, and so that's my thoughts on that. And um, I'm, I'm sure that they're, I know I'm guessing you guys did this for ease, but is there any reason you chose to include commercial with uh, the 60 as well as whole, uh, host present? Uh, we did present uh, those options to the planning commission and they ultimately recommended just the one licensing structure. Yeah, so if you look at some prior planning commission aims, you'll see we gave four options and I think the second one, we like this one the best for, you're right, for ease of one licensure, but the second option was to break out commercial licenses. Yeah, I'm how in many, favor, how many personally are, in favor of that. How many are those right presently? Are there? How many, how many commercial STR licenses are there? Okay. If you just give me one second. Yeah, no, yeah, no worries. Oh, actually, I'm sorry. I don't have internet, so I can't get you. Oh. Let me see. I have it. Thank you. Um, and one of these aims. Thank you both for your. Sorry, we're having the the internet technical difficulties. Oh, um, sorry. I'm gonna need a little more time. We'll have to get back to you. Uh, Keep going. What, we'll get back. Uh, I just kind of follow on comment to Tanya's is, you know, in terms of like renting out a room in your house versus renting an entire house. Um, it, it seems like, the, you know, in terms of pre preserving our housing stock that the, there's, there seems like there could be some sort of benchmark of it, if it's a residence or structure that can, can be a full-time residence for somebody, um, that, that those types of residences should have, maybe have a higher level of restriction than a room in a house or somebody's got an ADU that is, you know, doesn't have a kitchen, you know, just, uh, you know, got a, got, you know, a coffee pot or whatever. Um, it, th those seem different things compared to um, a full house with that, that could potentially be a full-time residence for someone. 
So really quick, the answer to your question as of August, so I, maybe these might be slightly wrong, but there were 12 Class C licenses. 12 Class C, which is commercial. Which is commercial. No, well, much? it's, yeah, it's Central Business District, General Commercial, Industrial. Okay. Um, so how many, um, how many licenses are for like a bedroom? Or part of a home? We would have to look into that. Yeah, we don't do licensures by that, so that would require us to go look at right. individual Okay, licenses. but 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 folks who are doing that, don't they have a license? They have a primary residence, host present or host not present license. Oh, okay. We don't do it by, like, are you renting a bedroom or your whole house? We don't do it like that. Oh, uh, so you don't really know. Okay. Well, but, but if the host is present, you can't rent the whole house unless they're sleeping in their camper. Well, it could be a, 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 an attached ADU. Mm-hmm. That counts as yeah. most present. Well, I know, I guess, I know, I know you're trying to simplify things, but I just don't think it's a simple thing. Right. So I, let's just kind of use the example of, uh, you know, you've got a primary house and then you've got a, a guest house or a, you know, a tiny house or a, a garage apartment or whatever, like that still counts as host present. Right. That's like, you're not renting out. So okay. the trouble with the host present, host not present is that there's no compliance software or really any type of regulation that can determine when a host is or not present when the guests are there. They can generally be present when the guests are there, but they could also go on their own vacation to Florida for the week while they are simultaneously renting the home to guests. So I can't ever really tell if a host is present or not. Well, I, I would I would like to see something that we are as conscientiously as possible making an effort to preserve our full time housing stock for residents over STRs. Thanks. I, I, I do. I know we're going to have public comment, so um, I just want to see, are there any more clarifying questions or things that you'd like the public to hear before there are, before we open up for public comment? There's no one in the room, so we're going to do public comment. There's no one in the room anymore, so um, folks online, uh, if you'd like to make a comment, now is your time. Kathleen, I see your hand go up first, so. I think her hand went up, at least I saw her name. I believe she needs to call in. Oh, go, yeah, go ahead and call in. I have a, a public comment that was dropped off to me. Okay, we have, we have one comment that was someone that was here in the audience that did leave. Um, mm -hmm. So Kathleen, just you can go ahead and connect, but we'll go ahead and have Macy read this okay. public comment. Sounds good. So this comment was written by Teresa, Teresa Crush Warren. And I'm going to read it exactly as is. First off, under summary, the first sentence reads, the BOT discussed changes that were needed. How did the BOT surmise that changes were needed? Was there a short-term rental expert that came before who examined current policies? Did it come from multiple complaints from neighbors of Airbnb hosts? Or was it a bureaucrat at town hall who decided a two-year-old survey which indicated more long-term housing was needed should finally be acted upon. The answer to first question is that I'm sure no expert was consulted. The town might have looked at other towns policies but each town is unique and there is no comparison to Netherland. Even appointing a group of current Airbnb owners and managers would be the more appropriate and democratic thing to do. There are two sides to regulations on short term rentals from the very beginning of town initiating regulations on Airbnbs. We have not been invited to a true work session where each side gives and takes. We are tired of a new regulatory tax being required each year that we were not given notice. It was being considered by the board. So let's schedule a work session before any more regulations are put in place. Another trend that is happening is that the free economic market is shifting. There were more short term rentals 2 years ago than there are. So more owners are renting long term. The problem is not so much finding long term housing in Netherlands. It is being able to afford it. 
What is really needed is more affordable housing. Landowners should be given incentives, parentheses, like Tungsten Village was deeded some land, end parentheses, to build it. This is how providing long-term housing should be best planned for. There is long-term housing out there to be had. It is just not affordable to service and hospitality workers in this town, and they are the ones who need it. Thank you. Thanks, Teresa. Next, I did please. have to mute Kathleen. There was a background noise, so star six, Kathleen. Okay. Kathleen, go ahead. Thanks for Can being you hear me? Star six. Yes, we hear you. Kathleen Chip, I, uh, 33 year Magnolia, East Magnolia resident. Um, I'm going to second what uh, Teresa's letter said. Um, I don't understand. Well, I don't understand how we don't have the numbers of how many are uh, bedroom rentals, whole house rentals. I think if the people are living in their house or renting a room, there shouldn't be any limits. Uh, whatsoever. I mean, if this is all because town staff feels the need to make it easier or whatever, um, it's never made any sense to me from the beginning. Uh, I second what Teresa said about having any kind of workshop or engaging anyone. Um, I also, I'm glad to see that if somebody gets a complaint and loses their license that they go before the Board of Trustees. And that's how it used to be for any business license in Netherlands. Um, I would like to see the business's language change because that's how Alicia screwed regular businesses. Now we uh, appeal not to the Board of Trustees if we're gonna lose our business license. We're appealing to the town administrator who is the boss of the clerk so it's one segment, you know, here, I'm glad to see that the Board of Trustees will be the final decision if someone should lose their STR license. It should be equal with all business licenses. And right now, everybody else's business license, Miranda right now, and Macy herself, both of them could take a person's actual business license from them without having to pass it in front of the BOT right now at all. So I'm glad to see that that was changed and the BOT will decide if the license is removed. Uh, the same change needs to happen under regular business licenses. And I'm just really upset because as a business owner, the STR visitors to our community bring in lots of money, lots of money to the businesses. So I think you're shafting people with room rentals, I can't believe it's gone this far. I don't like the fact that you're gonna require STRs to have a, a bear proof container for trash, but nobody else. I mean, you can't do these single, singling out groups of people with regulation, over regulation, insanity, okay? It's not, it's not American. It's not, I don't even think it's legal, okay? You can't treat, if you're gonna treat STR businesses licenses, to be removed, they go in front of the BOT, that's the same as it should be for all business licenses. Everybody should be treated the same. And if somebody has a room to rent in their house that they're living in, uh, they should be able to rent as many days of the year and as many of those that happen, you have a tenant living in the house, nobody's lost housing, renting a room is gonna help them afford to continue to live in hey. Netherland because nobody- Thanks, Kathleen live in Netherlands. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Kim Goho. Kim. Kim Goho, town Netherlands resident and family for over 30 years. Um, my husband and I run a single family primary resident host present STR and have since 2020 without any issues. We're concerned with the proposed recommendations to regulate STRs even more than they are currently. It feels like those of us running primary resident rentals who are trying to keep our families with children in the community are being punished for a few property owners that are not being held accountable to the rules already set forth. These proposals, in addition to some of the current regulations and recently passed regulatory fees are discriminating against a group of people that a small vocal minority of the town has issues with. If there are repeat offenders who still have current, a current license, then town is failing to uphold the current regulations. The STR license agreement includes many of the complaints that you've talked about tonight. 
um, that the concerned community members are sharing. As STR owners, we agree to multiple rules, including proper trash removal, parking, and that there's a hotline available for complaints. I read the letter submitted by Judy and have, have heard similar problems with one SDR with a bomb fire. I feel sorry for those people with multiple or who are affected by these bad apples because they do not represent the SDR that we and many long time locals operate. Um, a couple other points to further add more regulations seems to be against the feedback shared that the town staff needs to spend less time on SDR regulations. Also, what happened to using the taxes to hire someone dedicated to STRs? Um, from what we can tell, this is non-primary resident STRs that are the problem, which is why town um, initially had stricter regulations. So why would we now want to loosen the regulation for those owners who are not primary Netherlands residents, especially to those who are offenders? Um, it's also mentioned in every new proposal to further regulate STRs that it's because the town has a need for more long-term renters. I'm concerned that the town continues to put the needs of families wanting to live here over the families that already live here and have done so for multiple decades that are just trying to make ends meet. Most primary resident host present STRs are not going to convert into long-term renters due to the inconvenience and potential safety issues related to having long time, full-time tenants in a single family home. Here's what I propose today. Town should uphold and hold the SDR owners to the re re requirements, restrictions, and standards set forth in the SDR ap application. As um, one thing that is not mentioned, specifically number four, it requires a local contact to be available to respond to any issues related to ensure the health, safety, and enjoyment of our neighborhoods. That includes trash removal, noise levels, parking, and, and this would solve the problem, period. If there are problem STRs that are held to the standards and penalized as agreed upon, then the rest of us can be left alone without further micromanagement. If you cannot penalize an STR owner for what for he said, she said, undocumented acu acu uh, accusations, then you should not be able to add more regulations based on he said, she said for just a few bad apples. Thank you. Thanks, Kim. And for Tommy. Is Andrew before Travis? Andrew. Hi guys, uh, Andrew Dewart, uh, 787 West 1st Street, Netherland resident. Um, you know, I'm kind of late on the, the whole STR um, info, but just as having a, being a, what I would consider, you know, I'm a primary resident. I do have a uh, call basement apartment, which luckily don't have to rent out right now. Just the kids, kids use it, but if I did need to rent it out, you know, I think I would hopefully not want lots of, uh, you know, what I would expect would be an inspection and I wouldn't want lots of onerous regulation, whether it was a short term or a long term rental, certainly a bear proof, you know, trash can, which I just have anyway. And I think you would need if you put your trash outside. Um, but, you know, I, I think for a primary residents who you're not, I wouldn't necessarily be taking any housing stock off the market. It would be just opening up additional housing stock for whether it's short term or long term. You know, it seems that that should be a different and I know other other residents that, you know, have similar uh, apartments in the house that aren't occupied. And I would hate for things to for of rentals to not be able to hit the market because there is a cap on licenses for primary residents STRs. So that's, I just wanted to share that. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, Andrew. Appreciate it. Travis. Maria, I see your hand was up too, but Travis is was first. So Travis. Oh, thank you. I appreciate the uh, opportunity to go in front of Rhea. Uh, 75 Wolf Tongue uh, Court property owner. Um, I live in an industrial area and I have a, a Class C license. I'm, I guess I'm not quite sure what the, what the problem is in the licensing. And I'm not quite sure why we, we need to continuously reanalyze and have a analysis for analysis paralysis with this issue. Um, my understanding is that the Class C license would be 
grandfather then. Um, however, it would not be transferable to the, the next property owner. So if I was to sell my property, the successful short-term rental that I have that contributes to the economy, the tourism, and the uh, walkability of the town would be essentially hindering the property value of my property that I exist today. Uh, so my question is, what is the problem with the current licensing? And is it just a regulatory convenience of the town staff? Or is there really, um, if we want to require airproof canisters and put a fire ban on people, that's not a big issue. I've dealt with 200% increase in my fees um, with no notice and uh, no notice of current inclusion of consideration for changes to my current licensing. I was never informed by town staff, uh, never informed by the board of trustees that my license could be changed or altered. Uh, where's the transparency? I mostly agree with Teresa Crush Warren's sentiments, and uh, reluctantly, I would agree with Kathleen Chippai's uh, sentiments here on the uh, transferability of licensing and uh, business licensing. I think that the town is currently trying to handicap themselves uh, by under the guise of making it easier for their jobs. So you would essentially, by changing this current ordinance, be handicapping and changing my property values to the next seller if it was not transferable to the next buyer. I'm all about common sense changes and I'm all about finding solutions to current problems and I will belabor the problems of current housing inventory, et cetera. However, those of us that have been operating responsibly for many years, four or five years, uh, do not feel that we should be subsequently penalized by. Thank you. Thanks, Travis. Perfect time. Rhea? Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Rhea Ortner Roble. <clears throat> I am a Gilpin County resident, but own property zone general commercial in Netherland, right on Highway 119, kind of kitty corner from St. Rita's Church. Um, <clears throat> I submitted a comment letter. You all probably have read it. I'm not going to read it. Um, but I just, <clears throat> in listening to Macy's very succinct kind of summary of why they came to this situation of wanting to simplify licenses, it seemed to me that the issue was more about um, the primary resident and how many days they were actually occupying the building and how many nights they could rent out. In my commercial uh, vacation rental, you know, we're unlimited the number of days and I don't have to be a town resident. And I fought hard for that when these regulations um, first came to be. So I don't see why the Class C licenses are effectively going away and that a person like me who's been in the community for almost 30 years can't responsibly operate a short-term rental, which is not even in a residential area. Now, some of you on the board might be wondering why the heck is Netherland even um, allowing short-term rentals in a commercial property? It's commercial. Why are there even residential uses? And that is because of a really great ordinance that was passed a few years ago allowing something called mixed use in commercial zones. So, and in that ordinance, um, you know, as long as your ground floor is commercial, which mine is, um, I operate my ecology consulting firm, you know, the top floor or back end or whatever the regulars say, you can have um, a residential use there. And actually in my building, I have two residential uses. I have one long-term tenant and I have one short-term short rental, which really works out very well for the layout of this very funky old A-frame building. And I guess I just am very concerned that um, the Class C license, which includes general commercial, that includes industrial, and interestingly enough, because of the old zoning laws, or people like Travis Brock, who just spoke, that actually has a house that's in a zoned industrial place. 
Um, you know, we're not, we've never had a complaint. Um, I don't feel like we're taking away housing from some, somebody else. Um, so why are you penalizing people like me? So again, I feel like keep the class C license, let non-town residents um, run it in those commercial areas. Um, and we shouldn't be um, up for the cap. And then just one other thing I want to mention quickly, I'm also on the Gilpin County Planning Commission. And they went through this whole thing with short term rentals. And they do not, they have a cap, but they, anything that's owner occupied is not subject to the cap. And I heard like, well, how do you regulate? It's actually pretty simple. You look at the Airbnb listing. Are they listing a room in their house or a whole house rental? It's very simple. If you can just see, oh, they're just renting a room in their house. It's obviously owner occupied. If they're renting a whole house, hey, they're in violation. So you, um, even though it doesn't directly affect me because I'm not a town resident, I really do think that it is very different, a room in your house versus a whole house rental. Thank you. Thanks, Rhea. Appreciate it. Any other comments from folks um, online? There's no one, no one in the room right now. So if you're online, if you have a comment, now is your time. This is Travis Bragg. May I make, make an additional comment? Yes. We, oh, Travis. Um, no, sorry. Our kind of rule is that one, no one, sorry. Man. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, well, hearing none um, and seeing no hands up the whole roster here, uh, I will bring it back to the board for discussion and, and to kind of address the questions before the board. Um, um, this is Tanya. I, sorry, I'm gonna come back in a second. Judy had sent me a text earlier today, wanted me to read her letter out loud. And I thought I had it up here and I don't see it. So I'm gonna do that. And as a disclaimer, I'm not personally for or against the letter. She just wanted me to read it. So that's, but I'll be back. Sounds good. Is it the one she sent yesterday? Cause we have- Yeah, the, I mean, we, I know we all have it. So I don't, yeah, I don't know if, I, she asked me to do it, and I mean, I, I don't want to be it's, a jerk and say no, but well, you could. I don't have could, to. You guys have all read it. I mean, yeah, it, it, it's yeah, we've read it. It's in if it's in the packet. If it's what she if she's saying something today, that's different. But the no, one that she submitted no, yesterday. So you're right. I don't have. You're right. It's in the packet. Probably. Page two hundred one. So Judy, it's here, and we've read it. And, okay, um, perfect. Then good. I didn't know it was in the packet. Um, okay. I do have other comments, but I'll let everybody else go first. Well, and I'll I'll jump in here because uh you know one of my comments uh, relates kind of to her, her. I think her primary concern is is enforcement of you know this stuff and you know who's responsible. Um, you know, kind of it seems like resorting to uh, you know reported violations, which are generally going to be neighbors. Um, you know, I think that like sort of kicking the enforcement can down the road to rely on people to complain um you know that that's that's bad for neighborhood relations neighbor you know neighbors relationships and and i think it's kind of bad for neighborhoods in general um to kind of count on people to call out their their neighbors on stuff um you know obviously having a staff person who's dedicated to STR enforcement is a, you know, that's a, a complicated expense, but if we are, you know, charging the appropriate fees for licenses, it seems like something we could probably figure out a way to have somebody who's at least part-time uh, committed to just keeping an eye on, you know, who's staying, you know, this is, seems to be a common sentiment among some of the people who are, uh, you know, operating successful stay within the guidelines sdrs are saying you know we're being punished for people who are not um and then there are residents who feel you know sort of uh like they don't like to have to call out their neighbors and are struggling with getting enforcement 
um, you know, this kind of solves both of those issues. Um, I have a couple others, but I'll let some other comments in first. And so I'm sorry, Luke, be, sorry, it must have been my connection. You cut out a little bit, but or, or so you're recommending was it someone part time to oversee this? Is that what it was? Well, yeah, I mean, I think, you know. If we're charging the like, our, you know, our fees that we charge for STR should be appropriate enough to cover some level of enforcement of the rules and not rely on neighbors and residents to call it out. Okay, and just to be clear, Macy, right? You've only ever had to reach that with one particular person, so it's maybe not as ongoing of an issue based off the but, workload that you've experienced, Macy? So short-term rentals takes up 25% of my time as town clerk. Um, so we're talking about delegating short-term rentals to another person who can help me within town staff. Um, but just that's just the ongoing maintenance of it. It's not the complaints. The complaint part you said you've only dealt with one. I deal with complaints on a regular basis. The severity is different, and I've only had to reach violation with one short term rental operator over behavior. I've had to reach violation on taxes before. Um, okay. But typically when I get a complaint, as I mentioned, I'm able to contact the short term rental operator and work through it with them. Okay. Yeah. And, and I guess my, my point is, is that, you know, we're offloading the responsibility of enforcement to neighbors and, and residents to complain. Thank and you. I think that's, that's kind of putting a, a an unfortunate burden on on our community so my question is so does this person drive around to the to, to, to the you know each night to all the places they know are rented out and just make sure nothing's burning and bears aren't ripping the guy i'm like like I, I don't know how that plays out logistically right i mean obviously that's i think that's a question of like okay how much can we afford to do and you know maybe that's just somebody who keeps an eye on their bnb listing and is just kind of tracking, you know, what people are listing and renting and, or maybe it's somebody who makes a, you know, a monthly round or, you know, I, I don't know exactly what that works out to be logistically, you know, obviously personally, you know, fire is like one of the big, you know, like that's super scary. So, um, but I think the logistics of that is more driven by what can we afford based on the fees that we have and how much of you know, Macy's time can we save and, you know, I mean, if, if you're not having to deal with complaints because somebody's actually out there, you know, dealing with stuff on the ground, you know. I'm, I'm with you. I, I think it warrants further discussion. You know, we may come to the idea that it doesn't work for us, but I think it warrants a future discussion on that. Well, I mean, we do have this contract with the Boulder County Sheriff's Office that we will sure. you know, have some deputies here before you know it. Um, oh, no, and, I'm with, and, and, I mean, that seems more like the enforce. I mean, this is ultimately a, an ordinance, you know, you know, these are. So, so I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, and I like the idea. I'm just trying to think of the reality of it. So, it, well, as far as ordinance goes with that, do we have somebody who enforces ordinance? Me. Well, this yeah. well you have a lot of people, Boulder County Sheriff's Office, sure. code enforcement through state bills, sure. and other town staff members, but yes. Okay. Yeah, but who but we don't enforces have... it at 9 p.m.? Law enforcement. Or 1 yeah. p.m., right. 1 a.m., you know, like Boulder, for... Yeah, law enforcement. Boulder County sure, Sheriff's right. Office will take, you know, say it's a noise complaint, they'll, they'll take it, which again is what I'm saying, and again, in that specific situation that we're seeing, we, if we know law enforcement is called because it's a nighttime incident, our first call is to law enforcement to say what happened here. Sure, and and but we don't have like a dedicated person that just does. It's just false. You have a code multiple. enforcement officer who is paid for four hours a week and comes up once a week for four hours. Okay, and is that a are they safe law enforcement or safe, that's safe, safe, bill. safe bill? Okay. 
Okay. Otherwise, town staff, you know, but again, these overnight calls, that's why we've been encouraging people who, who are navigating these more complex situations to contact law enforcement so we have that documentation to be able to take. Yeah, you know, absolutely. But, but sometimes when we talk to law enforcement, law enforcement has said, this is not, this did not shape out as it's being described. To sure, you. no, and, and I've totally experienced that myself personally. Um, and, um, <clears throat> You know, and I, I see that, you know, once the general working day is done, yeah, it kind of falls on law enforcement for sure. But I just wonder if it wouldn't be worth in the future just to have somebody that does is strictly code enforcement for your average working day. I, have, I think we've, we've talked, I mean, SafeBuilt can provide that to you, but I think when SafeBuilt came forward, and this was a conversation a couple of years ago, Jake Cook was like, there's not there's not enough calls to warrant paying him 40 hours a week. No, yeah. To do code enforcement. Okay. We even had him doing eight hours when we didn't have law enforcement. And I would argue that was a stretch to fill his day. Sure. With eight hours. So he's back down to four. Okay. But, you know, to, to bring it to back to what the folks who have been um during during public comment what they were talking about was the perception of them being punished and so you know a couple of things i want to address there um it seems like part of the punishment is okay now i have to supply a bear resistant trash can that could be an additional cost um there's even a potential that i'll be capped right i won't be able to maybe just one of my STRs per property, and now there's only six left, there's going to be a cap. And I do want to go back and address the comment that who who said that there was an, a housing shortage. Um, where where did you get the, the, you know, the idea that we had to sort of um, make room for more long term rentals? And I guess I'll just direct everyone's attention back to our housing study where it broke down both the rentals that needed that we were lacking and, you know, uh, somebody else's comment who said, you know, that's catering to people who want to move here. And I would argue that it's actually not. We even have folks on town staff who cannot afford to live here anymore and who are having to move down um, into the flatlands because they just they can't they can't find anything. There's nothing available. It's not within their price range. So I do want to be sensitive to the fact that this is not just about people who are wanting to move here. We do have a deficit. It was about 50 to 60 yeah. rentals, long-term rentals, I believe that we are um, short of. So part of the cap is it's not just it's not gonna it's not the silver bullet. Of course it doesn't solve our housing problem, but it is one tactic of an overall set of tactics to hopefully just drive increases in the availability. Very good point. And those are bullshit. Those are kind of real numbers. Yeah, and that's I mean, Nicole, that dovetails into one of my other points of, you know, I, I mean the cap is definitely one way to do it and potentially the most effective. Um, but I do wonder if there's some way of trying to come up with a simple way to delineate STRs that, like I was saying before, that could be, because there's a lot of people who run STRs that I mean, they just would never be a suitable uh, full long-term rental property. Um, and if we could find some way to simply uh, delineate between properties that could be full-time rentals and properties that could not be, and keep our cap on the ones that could be full-time rentals and that units that were not viable full-time rentals could either be held to a higher cap or not capped. Thanks, Luke. Who determines that? I am, um, yeah, go ahead. Who, who else has, who else, uh, which other trustees have? Uh, I have something to say, but I've asked other people go ahead of me too. So I've talked a lot. Um, first, I'd like the class C to stay the way it is. I, I don't think simplifying is the way to go, unfortunately. I think we should hold, 
room in home, not just host present, because I think ADU should count towards the cap, but room in your home should not count towards the cap. Um, I think the bear proof makes perfect sense in response to Kathleen, why short term renter are not regular homeowners. I think it's because the tourists, they're not familiar with bears. They're used to putting their trash out. They think there's trash pickup or something like the suburbs of where they're from. And it's not that way. And, and I think that that's, it makes sense to have that because we are catering to tourists and not to locals and locals know better in theory. Uh, personally would like to see a restriction towards corporations owning short term rentals, unless it's in the commercial district. That's, but I don't, there's not that. And I also, wanted to have like a year you can't just buy a house and turn it into short term rental unless you're in the commercial district there should be a, a year at least own the house for a year before you do it um and that's in response to a rash of million dollar homes purchased in big strings neighborhood that instantly got turned into short term rental never saw the light of day as any host president it was never primary somehow they got the documents i don't think it's that hard I love that they're going to have to submit it every year, so that will at least keep them from having to register where they actually live. Um, but yeah, those are my suggestions. Um, I think my issue with the short term rental isn't homeowners renting a room isn't in the commercial district. Um, it was more towards because of uh, seeing how many homes were just being bought and turned into short term rental instantly. It was never anybody living in these homes pure business, um, and I don't like that. So I like the idea that if I want to live in the community, I'm a community member, and now I want to move and travel, now I want a short-term rental my house, I think we should all be allowed to do that. But I don't like the idea of people just buying a house and turning it right into short-term rental, and that's why I wanted there to be a, for primary resident host not present, there to be a, uh, a a minimum amount of time you needed to own the home before you could do that. But uh, that also didn't get a lot of traction with the PC. So that's fine. Those were my ideas. Um, and, and those are how I, I kind of still want to see class C the way it is. And I kind of want to see uh, a room in a home or a basement in a home, not count towards the cap. I think that would, that would give a lot of people in those er that, that realm, a little bit of relief. Um, so, and I, I do think the, we need to figure out a way to really, I don't know, because I know that some of those, not the one that Judy was talking about, there was another one down the street that recently sold to somebody to, who was going to live there, but they were having big parties and somehow it never got documented. Um, fires during, I guess the police didn't come, maybe it was during the time we didn't have police, I don't know, but people do get away with stuff, even with Macy checking on it and stuff and all that. So anyway. Stop villainizing us to yours. Can he? He's um, I, Travis. Please mute yourself, please. Um, I can't like lock him. So, um, so I have a question. Um, I appreciate all those comments. Actually, thank you, um, Tanya. I'm just looking at the question for the board. There was something about 63F and the property. We haven't talked on that at all. It said, uh, "Does BOT want to see any changes to the ordinance, including possibly amending section?" 6-93F to include the word property. So I understand that particular one for it. So that's just kind of going off of what Trustee Corvalon mentioned about having one short-term rental per property. Okay, okay. So, you know, instead of per, be a, to a person is what it Nine. says. 693F is is only one license of, I mean, without being edited, it stands as this. Only one license of any type, primary residence, class A, class B, or class C license may be issued to a person. Mm -hmm. So, but it's been edited to strike out all license these, types. License types is just as only one license may be issued to a person. So that um, I think is basically saying multiple, one person cannot run, operate multiple STRs. So is that what that question before the board is, was specific or was it saying only one per property? Is that what? I, th I think that the, the question on the aim um, was a product of the discussion with the planning commission and some confusion that came out of that discussion. So first off, I think it should be clarified for everybody that person is defined in the code already 
in your definitions in chapter one, and a person is a natural person, a joint venture, joint stock company, partnership, association, club, company, firm, corporation, business, and it goes on. Um, yeah, so it's not it's not a, a natural person, and that's a legal definition. A natural person is is you and me. A person can include a corporation, other legal entities. Um, but really, an entity can only have one STR license, um, and you can only have one STR license on your property. Um, because the owner should be the one who is the licensee. So even if you have a, a husband and wife, you have two people um, listed as the owners of the property, they should both be listed on the license. And it, it can't be that um, person A gets one license on the property and person B gets a second license on the property. And I think that was the concern that came out of the planning right. commission, but um, that's not how the code should be interpreted. Right. So, so, so really the property, so you, what you're kind of saying is that isn't necessary. Right. Because right. The, question, the definition of person really covers. Yeah, exactly. Because you have to be an owner. So the owner is the licensee. So if you have, if you have multiple people owning, you can only, you know, there's only one, um, STR license per property. Okay. Okay. Thanks. So just a clarifying question. What if a said person owns two properties in, in town? Can they have a short term rental on each property? Can they only have one short term rental? They can only have one short term rental. Okay. Thanks. Any other comments and questions from them? Uh, just, just a clarifying question. So, um, this would say uh, um, only owner occupied residences can get an STR license, right? We, we're not going to do. Correct. That that's the way that the draft is written in front of you. Yeah. Not, but not that it would be owner occupied. Right. But that the primary, the primary, the owner would prove primary residency, yes. and the owner would obtain the license. But primary residency at that address. Yes. Right. So, like, it it works if you have a detached prop rental, but not if you are going to rent out the entire house and live somewhere else. Yes. Any other comments on the? the there's on page you know, of the one eighty six of the packet. There's that little table about the one, one two three seven things that are proposed um any specific comments on those because and, and then the questions before us are like we do we have questions we've been covering that and and then do we want to see any changes to the ordinance i, I want to get those out so that we can have an out of four in them yeah yeah i mean i i think that of of the things that would i think suggest changes would be um you know, I, I think I, I agree with Tanya's sentiment about the class C licenses for commercial industrial areas that that maybe we should keep those. Um, and then I think the cap on licenses, I think we should evaluate if there's a viable way to uh, have that cap tied to the type of um, rental that we're dealing with. Um, you know, Tanya's point of, you know, a room, a room in a house being different than renting out the entire house. I don't know exactly where that line is, but I just think that there's, there's, it's worth taking a little bit of a closer look there. Isn't the tax based on number of bedrooms? Are you able to at least do some kind of, you know, generalization based off that? There's just number of bed. I can't remember now because is it number of bedrooms rented that night or just number of bedrooms available in the STR? Number of bedrooms in the short term rental. Yeah, I mean that, that definitely seems like it's a it's a number that, that, that we could you have one bedroom homes. 
Yes. So I'm not saying it's, I guess what I would right. I say is. I feel like we need to, yeah, I feel like we need to break these apart. And that's fine. I, definitely what I We just don't have that data regularly available. That's something Meeks is going to have to to research. Yes. Yeah. Fine. I just want to be mindful of that. That's the reason why we yeah. don't, because there are one bedroom homes. There are integrated ADUs. It's just the way that's the current true. ordinance is written. That's true. And, and did you have anything else? So, yeah, I'm, if I go across the little table, I, I think I do agree that um, I think going to multiple license types, or at least I, I agree with some of the cons consolidation that's happened. I, I feel like having less of them is, is I, I would agree with some of those going, but the, the type C, you know, the commercial and, and all the zones that incorporates, I feel like wouldn't, in my mind, wouldn't go towards the cap. Um, and I, I do like the primary residence. I, I agree with that one. Um, I think the cap number, if, if we're going to cap, I'm at, initially I kind of liked the moving percentage, but I get that, you know, that that's a pain in the butt because the, you know, houses will, the number of houses will change. So I feel like a cap that we revisit at a reasonable time frame is a way to go. And I think, you know, um, so if the, if the, you know, I, I don't think 60 is going to be the magic number unless it just happens to work out. You know, if we take, you know, what I'd like to do is take the type C out of that total. And so that cap may need to be adjusted. Notify neighbor. Um, agree with that one. I definitely agree with bear, push, bear proof containers and fire bans. I feel like that's reasonable to ask. And like Tanya said, it's um, a lot of people come here just don't. You know, don't have bears in, in their world, and so they don't think about it. So I think that's a reasonable thing for folks to have. If, you know, if they don't already, like Andrew said, I mean, a lot of us uh, hopefully already think about that long before we think about an STR. Um, fire bans, definitely. Um, and I like the minimum stay because, especially with a cap, I, I do like the fact that someone's not taking up a valuable license if we go that route. Which I, the cap route, which I think we would, and so, yeah, and I'd like us to be, figure out how to better break out, um, you know, a whole home versus you know bedroom, you know, kind of a smaller unit, a fraction of the home. Um, that's what I'm thinking for changes, which is the second um, option two option, which is do I want to see any changes to the ordinance? Well, it's also, it's basically what you both have just spoken to is option two that was presented to the planning commission. Mm -hmm. See, I, I, okay. Yeah, I, that's almost exactly that table. It's in the, it's not in the packet. It's linked to the STR or the right, planning commission. Meeting. Yeah, I try to right. ignore things till they come to us. Yeah. Because I'm busy. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, no, it's linked, in, it's linked in our aim yeah. to their packet. Okay. So yeah. it's, it's option two that has, you know, class C removed a cap on class a in general, class A being the detached ADU. So it has everything except the the request you had of like somehow breaking out the whole house versus, you know, if you just are renting a room, sort of the original Airbnb. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. So that's, that's the option two that was presented to the planning commission that they chose to go mm -hmm. to option one instead, but or recommend option one. Right on. I'm having flashbacks from the dozens and dozens of hours that we did this. Yeah. Years ago. <laughs> Trauma. You got PT. <laughs> um, any other comments or requests from the um, trustees? And then, and then we probably need to organize this into a knot of four that gives you specifics. It sounds uh, like a, yeah. You know. And I think we need to talk about the moratorium because you're running out of time. So the question is, are you seeking to extend that? Or are you going to let it expire? Because we won't be able to get this, we want to bring this back to you as a discussion item before you vote on it again. When does it? When does it present? June fourth. Oh, oh. Two meetings in May. Yeah, we have two meetings in May, and, and when is it? There's a. I usually probably look at that forecaster because there's a lot no, of staff want to get done during my time here. And so adding that, thirty days on the moratorium. Um. Are there people waiting? I know we asked this question last time. It sounds like. If I heard you earlier, you're saying some people have l let their license go or chose not to. Okay, so do we have people that are like queued up and waiting for us? To my knowledge, I don't know. Oh, that's that. 
is good information. Well, I mean, maybe people just aren't bothering to apply if they know there's a moratorium. Yeah. I propose. Because so, you're right, I, I, I am just thinking through, I mean, the May, the two May meetings, which, you know, I, I want I wanted to have more stuff, and that's not going to happen. We're probably going to have to take step off. The two May meetings will not really be available. So we would need a discussion and, and an action. So we'd really need two meetings. If and we, if and 30, days, 30 days, unless you want to make the short term rental um, license an emergency ordinance as well. So you need so 30 we, days after publication for it to be effective. We really need two months. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I am. Um, so that would be. An, that's not as simple as us giving in not a four, is it? That no, is you have to bring it back a moratorium ordinance, which we could do. May 7th. Yes. Okay. 30 or 60 day extension. I'm not seeing option 2 easily. I'm in the aim and all I'm not, I'm not either. I was looking for well, it. So. I'm on the aim in your it packet. Nice under, yeah. under that yeah. table with all the licensing requirements that oh. a table with the CLP there's a link see. under there to see yeah, the with the portal options. meeting information that one would see to no, see the two and it says it'll take It'll take you to nettleandco.org. It'll take you to Planning Commission under Discussion Items 7.1 License Options Breakdown. Yeah, was, and then there's a new table that that'll open. So it so has four options. Just just sec, just to make sure you're so on page 186 of the present we're packet that we're working on. Right now. in the middle of the page is the blue link below the table. Hit that. Yeah. And after okay. you, after you've hit that, you come. You you know you go to a net page you know with civic whatever it's called and, and um um you get the old aim from the I just lost the freaking thing um not only is there an aim there's actually a table yeah it's seven point one yeah, there, there we go options breakdown the, yeah then then you get to an aim and then yeah you go to seven point one discussion item and then options breakdown so which is so I'd like to propose an idea here for this not a four Good. because we're looking at this and all the discussion that's coming together is seems to be coalescing around this uh, option two that was presented to the planning commission. So I'd like to propose we have town staff go back and reassess this with option two um, and to go with something Mayor Billy you said about um, you know since we're pulling out the class C reducing the total cap from 60 to 50 since we said we have roughly 12 class C licenses. And then we could bring that back an option two with a 50 cap as our discussion item at whenever it fits into the meeting agenda. But that could be our discussion item to kick off the next yeah. round of this. But tied to that would be a up to town staff 30 or 60 day extension to the moratorium. So I do hey. want to point out one thing with option two. So if you go to the aim, I did note an option two that we pulled out so class c used to be cbd is currently cbd general commercial industrial the recommendation is for it to be cbd general commercial neighborhood commercials i think we need a little clarification on if you want us to go with option c oh, no. do you want it to be the current zones as listed or do you want to add in neighborhood commercial? I, would, I would add industrial back in and and keep neighborhood commercial as well or take a neighborhood yeah, commercial i would take neighborhood out neighborhood commercial commercial out commercial. right keep it safe. out so cbd gc and i I would keep it exactly how it is, even not requiring primary residence need, for it because it's commercial. That. But that's my opinion. Just but most neighbor, yeah, I mean, most neighborhood commercial, though, is, you know, I mean, tends take to out neighborhood, in neighborhood if you drive down the road, look at the buildings. <laughs> More hey, neighborhood yeah, than no, commercial. That, 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 that should be included in the 60 total, in my opinion, the NC, but the. However, it is now, I think is working good for commercial. So, so yeah, what, what I'd recommend is class C is CBD, GC, and I. And C would just go into the cap. I, I'm curious, Miranda, what, what was the switch? Why was the switch made? There was a, there is a community member who's asked you, emailed you all before about adding neighborhood commercial back in. So, in acknowledgement of that request, and you don't really have uh residential zones in industrial and actually even under the new ordinance passed residential even is isn't even allowed to be constructed in industrial so therefore industrial makes really hardly any sense 
It doesn't make under the current uh, under the current use under the current use group table as written, but you always have a request for you to revisit industrial and housing from another person. Um, but currently, there's just no it. It just doesn't make any sense. So under the current. What? Well, so then I'm we curious. Well, how, so how is that happening? That's I guess. your contract we'll with that property. There no, so I I can't. Travis, you need to. Yeah, I can't mute. If I mute everybody on here, it will mute Nicole and Tanya. So, um, there are no industrial zoned short term rentals either. I don't think so. So, Travis, why Travis, is Brox. Travis Brox. Travis, yeah. Travis, so the, you need to is. stop talking. Please. Um, um, can what are the areas that are neighborhood commercial? The um, What's the most of Third Street is neighborhood commercial. Parts of Dyers or you know, the lower, what yeah. isn't that, that lower around third? No. Street? Yeah. First and second street, first and second street. That's yeah. That's the, uh, first and second is, is CBD. Well, you've got no, to no, no. no. East, uh, under, yeah, to, to trust Carlin's point, third street, second street is neighborhood commercial on the north side. So, wait, so can I ask, um, Chris, why did you, why were you advocating to have industrial in there? What was your reasoning for that? My sole reason was because we have the one person who. We've heard from tonight who has a STR that he's doing an industrial. It's the one house. I think it's like the one house in industrial. Yeah, that's that's was my reason too. Oh. But I'm so sorry. Did I mishear you before, Miranda? We we so we do have obviously one in oh, industrial. I, I don't know. I don't do. Yeah, sorry. I don't. I'm just answering. I really was asking, looking at Macy, asking for confirmation. Okay. So we so, do. Let, let, let's just. I mean, I'm just. I just generally, you don't really have housing stock in industrial. Right. right. But we have a STR in industrial <laughs> that's STR. that's been going on for a while. But so. generally, in terms of kind of where the majority of your housing stock is, is not sitting in industrial. Right. To me. Industrial fits more neatly into the class C bucket than any other bucket and, and it's happening. So I don't see why we wouldn't just put it there. Um, we'll be looking at that code probably soon enough. Um, that's my, that's what I'll nod on. On the class. Yeah, C. And I think as far as the neighborhood commercial that per person who wrote, I think they might be just happy to know that there's no longer a limitation on. How many days you can rent it now we have unlimited days. It's not half the year anymore. For owner unoccupied short term rentals, so I think that might have been the main issue for them. Um, so I don't think they should be included with class C. I agree. Because they're going to get 365 days a year of short term rental if they get 1 of those. 50, 60 licenses, so. But are, are we saying that we are not doing. Owner unoccupied, like yes. No, we have unoccupied. That's no, that's... no. We we are saying, um, Tanya, if you look at the table, whether it's the one on the present aim or an option to the primary residence, is still yes, and, and that's what I'll nod on. I think the primary residence is a yes um, for all those classes. Uh, class C, anything you know, I'm kind of. Going off what, you know, just kind of paraphrasing what Chris said earlier, like we're looking at option two, but we would look at class C and then and, and identify CBD, GC, and I. And this is going to come back as a discussion item, but I think it gets us a lot closer to what yeah, we're after. Yeah. And I want to have time now to talk about the moratorium extension or lack okay. thereof. So. Mayor Billy, could you ask on each of those? If we have a not a four. Okay. Um, um, for. So, yeah, I'm looking for a not a four on option 2. Which is up on the screen here. Um, the changes being that. I'll just start with the 1st column class C would be redefined as CBD, GC and I industrial. Um, and then column three there, we would drop the 60 total between class A and general to 50. In both um, class A and general, we would drop the cap to 50. Can I actually offer clarification? I guess I'm a little confused because I think there was a desire for the bedroom. And if you're going to go with option two, we're not looking at someone who's just renting out a bedroom. Right. That's a separate thing. So that's, that's not a general STS. I don't think you totally like option two. If I'm hearing you correctly, I think you. What? Oh, 
Oh, that you you want us to come back with maybe options that include the bedroom. Yes, that would actually the bedroom be bedroom awesome. not being a part of the total count because that is owner option. So a fourth a fourth row. Do you want the detached ADU as its own thing, or is it just Class C general STR and then like owner, you know, owner oh. present STR? D detached ADU and 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 bedroom. I mean, he'd say it's probably a better way of saying it, but like. It, so, do you know. want detached ADUs to not be a part of your fifty count? I don't think I, I'm not hearing any conversation about detached ADUs. No, you're right. I think, well, I think they count that could as be a, a discussion item for the next time. You know, yeah. like come back with a TBD. I, but but I, I may, like maybe to... may, maybe add go ahead and add a fourth row of a bedroom. You know, we'll call it. And you, you can define it better. With you know, yes, primary residence. No to cap. Yes, notify neighbor. Uh, yes. Air proof and yes, fire ban. I guess we can discuss those more later. And then yes to them, you know, and then minimum of four. So really, you know, just for sake of getting it back for a discussion item, add a fourth row bedroom. And the only thing that would be different you know, is the name is bedroom and the um, there'd be no in the cap column. I'm just going to add a quick note here about the definition of bedroom. Um, yes, yeah, yeah, I mean, we get we get pretty messy there. I mean, I've seen people convert. Uh, all kinds of things to something they would call a bedroom. Um, you know, we could stick to what the Boulder County assessor calls a bedroom in in a house. Um, but I, yeah, I, I just think closet, that's, right? it, it, isn't that the rule? Yeah, Seventy right. square feet and egress in the closet is, yeah. is like the ICC definition. Yeah. You know what? Let's not go there right now. Yeah, Let's go there next time. I'm going to move us on. And just just on. So I, I'm asking for I, I that. I just want to say one last thing, Billy. One last, one last thing. One last thing about okay. the Class C in Rea's defense, who runs a business. Yep. You froze. Is it just me, or did we lose her? We we lost her. She froze. Oh, okay. Tanya. Uh, oh shoot. See you, but we can't hear you. Um, I think for sake of time, we will, um, get that comment when we talk about it again in June. Um, so was there, was there four nods? Okay. And the, so we have the not a four on that recommendation on that table. And then on the moratorium, I'm looking for a not a four to bring back a, the resolution is on No, it's an ordinance. Bring back an ordinance to extend the moratorium for 60 days. I'm nodding. At least no. three. And and Nicole nodded. So we have not a four. If you're out there and if you're waiting for the moratorium to end, let us know that you're waiting. Because we don't think anyone's waiting. <laughs> right? I'm waiting. Um I, I just want to throw in a note on the uh moratorium. Timeline just reminding us that we have uh, Miranda's departure and interview. Yeah, no, 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 none of this comes back till June. That's the whole idea for the moratorium. Right, but even even still, like we're we're interviewing replacements for Miranda in the middle of May. Right. That's why this won't come back to us till June, till Miranda's gone. Well, right, but until we, even in June, we may not have a town manager. That's not that you need me. I'm just a sidekick in this game. We, we don't need a town manager. Right? Yeah, yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll have an interim town manager. I'm not, I'm not trying to be. I'm I'm getting a little. Um, just I'm noticing the time, and yeah. I know we have something else that's going to take time. One of which is you and make these meetings run so late. So so I'm getting a little pissed off. Um, so what what I'm saying is um. We're fine by extending the moratorium. Our logic for sixty days, folks, is it gives us. We don't have time in May to revisit this, so we'll revisit it in June, and then we need 30 days. We need both meetings in June and then 30 days. So 60 days is what we're proposing, and we've gotten a nod of four. Sorry, thanks. Thanks. With that, I am moving forward to um the next. Uh, sorry, folks. Sometimes I lose my cool. Um. Yeah, human. What the heck? Um. Rules and procedure and electronic meeting participation policy review. 
Brenda. Um, yeah, so we put this, there's been a desire by Board of Trustee members to revisit both of these. So we put them in the packet. Um, Attorney Madsen does have a, little, a quick little PowerPoint if you want to look at that, but initially we just want to get your kind of first feedback on if the, anything you want to change in some conversations that have come before the board previously is, you know, start times of meetings, um, the electronic participation, and if there are parameters around that, um, those are two of the big ones that I've heard in the past, but we just want to hear generally, do you have any feedback about initial changes? And then we as administratively and legally, we have our own recommendations that we would like to bring back to you as well. Great. So the question specifically before the board then are what initial feedback does the BOT have regarding the rules of procedure? What changes we would like to see to these two policies? Does do we give a nod afford to the town attorney and town administrator to work on amending these policies based on initial feedback? Well, okay. I'd like what to... sort of changes? Specific. Well, yeah. <laughs> Well, I think we don't know. One, I, I one specific it's, that's been tossed out a lot is a six o'clock start. Well, I'll be late a lot. <laughs> so if you do it, I might be late, but that's. I mean, another, I, I'm just going to throw another idea in there, a 630 start, you know, kind of, a, kind of a, just another, you know, starts earlier, but maybe not too early for folks that have a hard time meeting at six o'clock. So an earlier compromise. start. 630. An earlier start. Is one and the other was there was there have been appetites for like an electronic meeting participation policy. Um, and I don't know how hot that topic is anymore. Uh, yeah, given the, the new makeup of the this, board. <laughs> I, I was going to say, was this suggested by previous board members? Yes, that that particular one is. Okay, got it. Is there any existing board members here today, tonight, that have requested amendments? I, I, I think definitely the earlier start. I've heard Luke say, and I, and I've you know I've said because Jesse said a lot. You know, I, I see some value in that. I mean, the one thing I'll throw out there is executive sessions means that much earlier, and so that right. is that's where. I mean, I know like Eric now he's gone now, but like he struggled to get here at six. Um, yeah. and, and so we just have to look at the reality is I think everyone works now for a living full time who's on the board and, and um, um, some have more flexibility than others. And so we just have to think about those early times. But that one, I'd say at least has some interest in the present board. Uh, I don't know that the electronic um, put parameters around the hybrid option has the same appetite. When we're talking about an earlier start to the meeting, is coincident with that a no later than 1030, like shifting it back? Because right now we're 7 to 11. Does that mean 630 to yeah, 1030? Yeah, that, that, that that's the making these long. No, that's, no that's the motivation. That's an earlier end. I mean, I think that's the motivation. It's not so much the early start, right, but the yeah. early end. Certainly the, the time between 10 and 11, when the meetings go to full 11, nothing good happens. Yeah. You know. Uh, <laughs> uh, just to address the earlier start time of an executive session, um, I would propose that we always start at six, whether that's executive session or not. And if we have an executive session, maybe that means those nights we have to go a little bit later, but um, I, I think trying to start something at five o'clock is gonna, I mean, that's probably a challenge for everybody. Yeah. yeah um, say that I, safely. Okay, no, and I think that's an interesting idea. I guess just the Miranda and, and just, and then bring it back to town and folks who've been in meetings longer than any of us have, um, except for maybe Chris, um, that uh, does that mess with the general public to have two potential different start times? Variable start, like, is that going to be hard for folks who show up at six to say, oh, well, no, I didn't know there was an executive session tonight? I mean, that, that would just be the, I mean, it, that would just be the dynamic. I mean, I think it's hard to say. I think you see it now. Like we published that meeting started at six and a whole bunch of people jump on, then we have to kick them off. So when you go into executive session, so I mean we try to make it clear on the agendas, but I, I really can't answer that question. I don't really have a sense. And I also would say that a lot of people attend virtually these days. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> yeah. And I think virtually is a nice option because I, I travel for work. Chris travels for work, Nikki travels for work, um, and others probably do. And, and 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 just being able to be on the meeting really is great. 
Yeah. Just a question on the virtual participation thing. So that if I'm reading this, what's in our current uh, policy right now, it's just during times of emergency. Is that really what that says? Well, I don't know, I'm looking on page. So we adopted that during COVID, and I don't believe we. Am... Maybe we did, and I may have attached the wrong one. Okay. All right. Yeah. It just. But it's been the same language. It's not an emergency. We just kept the ability to participate in a hybrid capacity. Yeah, I just. And that all meetings would happen hybrid. Yes, I just wanted to make sure that we continue to keep that, as in all times. It also works out well when only a few of us can come here and, and we wouldn't have quorum otherwise and it allows us to have a meeting, even if we have to be all hybrids. So yeah, maybe that's something to add for the new people, the new trustees is that we only set up this room is that at least 4 of you can be in this room because this is a lot of work. And so that's why when Macy asks you, you know, are you virtual in person? It's really important for us to know. And if you're going to flip, if you say in person, and you flip to virtual, let us know immediately. Because if we can convert to an all virtual meeting to save this setup, then we'd like to do that. I just want to jump in with a, a 3 minute warning. Okay, um, I'm going to go ahead only for the sake. I think we'll be done with this discussion by 10, but I want to make sure I see some names on here and wonder. Uh, I want to allow for time for non public comment and non agenda items. Um, yes, and, and um, so I will uh, make a motion to extend the meeting and I'm just putting a buffer here to 10 15. Second. Thank you. Macy. I don't think it'll go that long, but I want to have Trustee it. Corvalon. Yes. Trustee Miller. Yes. Trustee Ty. Yes. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Sterling. Yes. Mayor Billy. Yes. And Trustee Larson. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Um, go ahead with whoever was just talking. Um, I, someone was, someone that was made a comment right before Macy. Um, okay. Are there, I guess, are there any other rules or, you know what one thing i'll just i wanted to tell folks who are new to the board and especially chris because you're on it before um we just do this thing where you know we'll have a motion in a second and then this is something we started doing about a year or so ago we'll ask we'll just make sure i say any more discussion because we've real you know we were railroading over some things where people didn't feel like they were done talking and so that's just one thing we're doing and i think it's working um so that's all Yes, it's working. Yep. It's been working. Um, yes. One other thing that we had talked about previously was potentially considering Bob's rules of order instead of Robert's rules of order. Um, yes. And I, I think that that would help a lot with meeting efficiency. Yep. Um, so just a, a suggestion. Yeah, they're, a reminder. they're basically Bob Widner. 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 Um, Took Roberts and turned it into Bob's, and it's a fraction of the length, and, and it really just has the important things. And it's just it's more of a, a um, clarity on how we run meetings. But it would it, not in a way if you've seen Roberts' rules of order, it's it's, it's a thick book. Um, both Chris Prey and Chris Larson gave me a copy, and I didn't read either. Uh, <laughs> um, so so I, I like that idea. It's like twenty. It's like twenty four pages. Twenty. It's a little bit longer than that, but yeah. the rules themselves are very short. Yeah. It's e easy to digest, and um, you know, I can tell you, I can, I can promise you, we don't follow Robert's rules of orders. So, if if you adopted Bob's, there's a better likelihood that we'd follow Bob's rules of order. Yep. Do we have that here in the package, Bob's rules of order? It's not. No. Um, I can send it out to you all. Um, yeah. Yeah, please do. Thank you. Are there any other? Um, and I am gonna, uh, yeah, I'm going to I'm going to open up for comments on on this rules of procedure and then I just share when those I am also going to have time for comment on non agenda items. So, if anyone has a comment on rules of procedure and electronic meeting participation policy review, now's the time. There's no one in the room. So, for just for folks online. Great. Um, not great, but he hearing none, um, I'll bring it back to the board and we just have to, um, talk, you know, we talked about initial feedback. 
what changes would we like to make? And, you know, specifically, I guess we're talking about rules of procedure, electronic meeting, not so much, but maybe start time is all I'm really hearing in Bob's rules of order. Um, we need, well, we'll I, I guess I'll put out there for a nod of four. We, I'd like to request that, Jennifer, that you bring back Bob's rules of order. And um, what about start time? I want to hear from everybody on that, actually. I like 6.30. Okay. Luke? Uh, I like 6, as I said previously. 6 to 10. I, I, I like 6, too, but I'm trying to be fair to Tanya. And okay. T Tanya, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Tanya, what do you like? I mean, I would prefer 6.30 to 6, so I'll put it there. Okay. I'm happy Nicole. with how it is. Okay. Nicole? Yeah, I'm I'm flexible. I can make 6, 6.30 or 7. Um, work so okay seven is Chris? i prefer seven but can make 6 30. You can later make, is better for me because but i'm a night owl so. work day oh yeah <laughs> yeah it's your work day yeah okay i'm flexible um yeah and and you know on most days so i can i can say you know 6 30 is a nice compromise um so that is what i guess we could say for sake of the, the not a four would be, you know, Jennifer, please bring us the um, Bob's Rules of Order. And um, uh, and then I'd like to work on amending these policies to look at a 6.30 start time that would be fixed at 6.30 and the executive session would just bump back the start time of the open, open meeting when we have executive session. So we start at 6.30 at all time, try to be done, you know, by or, by or before 10.30. Um, and, um, an executive session would mean that it, that the open meeting would start as late as seven thirty you know, for a general hour. I think you mean try to shoot be be done by nine. If we start at six thirty, we're done by nine thirty. Oh yeah. So, so um, well, no, it's 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 a four hour window that we're actually if you ch ch check ch 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 check your calendar invites. Um, yeah. Seven to ten though, right now. Seven. No, that's why we have the extension. We have to extend at ten. Oh. But but if you look at your invites, yes. right. the but placeholder is four hours. Yes. Right. Party's but that's four what hours. Normally, we, we, if we started at 6.30, we would be probably for extension so at 9.30. Th there you go. Yeah, that that, was, that is definitely um, would need to be written in there, too. So that's what I'm calling for for not for. I'm nodding. Nods from not online nods? Nodding. Okay. Sure. Yep. Okay. Okay. Uh, we got to. And it just. Verifying that our online partic or virtual participation is all the time. Yes. Yeah, I definitely didn't add that. So obviously amending the policy will take time and, and I'm just trying to assess if the desire to move to 630 is more urgent, in which case I would be handled separately than this whole policy here. I'm okay to stick with seven. Yeah, I mean, you're saying it's going to take time given that we're pretty booked for at least a month, if not two. No. Yeah. Okay. I'm okay with that. So, yes. Yeah. So we, we're already starting at six uh, in May. Yes, that's fine. Uh, we'll just we'll, 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 we'll make it. Um. Um. Yeah. It does. It's not. It'll fit in as soon as we can fit it in. It's not so, urgent. You, it? you have everything you need. Great. So if there's nothing else on that, I'd like to go to a uh, public comment on non-agenda items. And uh, we have no one in the room. So if you're online, hey, Brent, see your hands up. Thanks. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah. Yes. All right. Hey, thanks. I'll, I'll try to be quick, but I'm Brent Trigaskis, President General Manager of Eldora Mountain Resort. Um, I wanted to just, I know you guys had a, executive session of which I was not able to join in on. I think this is a pretty important uh, issue, the water storage right issue that we're up against. We do not have enough storage to store the water that we have rights for. And there's several places and runs we do not make snow on because of that. And I believe in climate change. And I think the future is, you know, the future of the resort dependent on water. So we need to work with you and the county. The county's really the one that is affected more. I don't think 
there's any negative downstream flows to that would affect the town of Netherland. Um, and before making this kind of an important decision, I would only ask that you get with us. Don't make that decision in a vacuum. We'd be happy to have a special workshop where I can bring in my experts to explain why we did what we did or suggested it. I can only I can assure you we did that with the environment in uh, in a sensitive way um, to worry about. We are concerned about the environment and we use people like Raya and the Army Corps of Engineers and some consultants. It was really why we use the existing um, adding to the existing ponds that we already have uh, rather than build new ones and some natural depressions that are already there. I think the river impact is virtually insignificant. I know that's a, one of the groups you're talking to, but we don't really have a big effect on, on Boulder Creek or any rivers. And um, we need to just kind of, these are natural depressions. It's basically off channel ponds that do not affect hydrology. And I think, you know, don't make those decisions in a vacuum. Um, we have more water rights than we have storage, the ability to store water. That's a big part of what we're doing. We've recently purchased the Ertl's property to accommodate this so we could possibly go in and make a difference uh, in our water storage. And it's not the headline of the newspaper was misrepresentative. It's really water storage rights. It's not it's not more water rights, it's storage rights. Um, so I, I don't think there's any negative impacts. Um, and I think, you know, we will we'll be continue to be a great partner with you guys. We're worried about the environment and uh, I would just ask, reach out to me personally and, and we'll, we'll give you more of the real details um, later. And then with that, I just wanna hand, uh, do a big uh, uh, handoff or a, a thank you to Miranda. She's been absolutely great to work with for a number of years. Uh, I've been around and she's been the easiest um, to work with that I've had in, in the town's uh, time and I uh, wish her well. So that's all I have. Thank you. Thanks, Brent. Appreciate your um, comment and, and being patient to give it here at the end. And uh, yes, I think we agree that our relationship with Eldora is very, the Eldora ski area is very important and we need to build on it and you know there's definitely a lot of things we will work together on into the future so thank you thanks any other public comments on non-agenda items Do, can you hear me yes kathleen chip i um i just want to talk about time and core requests and i put in a core request uh, a week ago for information that was unfulfilled from a previous core request months ago, which is how much staff time was spent on netter days last year and this year. And a full, that included a full accounting of expenditures for netter days. And that core uh, from uh, probably six, four, six months ago, has never been fulfilled. Uh, so I recore requested it, and then I core requested staff hours projected for this Netter Days event. And I, my response from Macy was that the, they need extra time so I wouldn't receive my documents until the 22nd of April. And, you know, the citation of Colorado revised statutes that allows for delaying uh, public record. Um, this does, I don't know what qualifies it, but it's not this. I, nothing, there's nothing on the platter of the town that makes the inability to provide documentation that's been correct, requested months ago or the new information for projected time this year. Um, and I'm sick of my core request claiming that there's some emergency in town, so you need two and a half or three additional weeks to, t to fulfill a core. I'm stunned, but I'm also hearing tonight that Macy says she spends 25% of her time on STRs, 
I don't understand what is going on there when we have one complaint. So I guess my concern is core requests are being violated per statute, number one. Number two, I don't understand what's happening with all the employees at town hall. I just don't. I just don't. What is what is being accomplished on the work shift day? I just don't get it. So that those are my complaints. Um, and I, if if the core of things just continually happen, then I'll have to go to municipal court. I don't want to do that. It's just this is insane to me that the a full accounting for netter days from last year hasn't even apparently doesn't exist because. The extra time, I think, is to create something to give to me. So I don't know what to say, but that is my complaint. I would like CORAs to be uh, filled in timely manner according to state statute and quit using this. Citing the statute doesn't mean it qualifies this excuse for needing to take additional time. So I'm bummed out about just basics again. So thank you. Thanks, Kathleen. Appreciate it. Any other comments no. on non-agenda items? All right. Um, hearing none. Any other business? Motion to adjourn. Second. Macy. Mayor Billy. Yes. Trustee Miller. Yes. Trustee Corbelon. Yes. Trustee Ty. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Sterling. Yes. And Trustee Larson. Yes. Okay. Thank you. The meeting is adjourned at 10 13 p.m. <laughs>